Okay, so um, I'm going to continue and I guess finish the, the workshop by moving to the field of computer vision. Uh, so Wojciech talked about NLP and I'm going to wrap up with computer vision, uh, the computer vision side of things specifically. Um, and uh, deep learning has had a huge, huge impact in that area over the last couple of years. And I'm going to, first of all, just kind of browse through some of the applications uh, that people have been looking at so far and you know, the kind of impact that deep learning has had in this field. Um, so here's the plan for today. I'm going to actually give two lectures. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about uh, on a pretty high level with the things that people have been doing. Uh, and I'm also going to give some kind of maybe philosophical ideas about how I think things are going to develop and what are currently the things to focus on and what are the things that are hot and so on. Um, and then in the second half, it's going to be much more of a research kind of talk. Um, I'll talk about the things that haven't yet been solved in computer vision, thanks to deep learning. Um, and I'll uh, discuss some of the approaches that people are looking at now in order to extend what has been done towards the whole field of vision, which is much broader than object recognition, which is sort of the, uh, the subfield that has kind of been solved by, by deep learning. And so what's interesting about that second part is that it has to do with uh, certain technical aspects like gating interactions uh, and orthogonality and stuff like that, which feeds back into deep learning in general. Um, so you have, during the, this workshop, you have heard about things like LSTM and stuff like that, and it turns out that a lot of insights can be gained by uh, looking at all of these things from a little bit mathematically from the perspective of orthogonal transformations and stuff. And that, is with, and that is, on the other hand, closely related to all this multi-view vision stuff. Um, I have a little bit of an option for the second half. So I also, uh, I could also talk a little bit about uh, uh, deep learning software frameworks, specifically Theano, which is what I'm basically using. Uh, so how many people here <coughs> would be interested in rather focusing on, the sec on this part here, on the code part, than... Uh, the research, so to, to kind of shift the emphasis a little bit towards the software side. Okay, so I'm gonna, well, we can still move things around and so on, so probably I'm gonna start maybe with the software side on the, in my second talk and then move to the research stuff after that, something like that. How many people here are, um, actually how many people are using Theano or are familiar with Theano? So would that be any of any use then? I mean, if most, the majority already uses Theano, and there's maybe no point in introducing it. Are there people who do not yet know Theano and would like to find out about it? Okay, that's also a lot, a lot of people. So maybe that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna show you how, uh, what, 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 on a very, really, really high level, what Theano is and how I would write code to, to do stuff. All right. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, so let's get back to the first part of this talk, um, <coughs> which is about computer vision. And so this is a computer vision task, maybe. Uh, you're given an image and you're supposed to tell what's in the image, for example. Um, does anyone know what's in the image? That's right. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> a cathedral in Havana. Um, and it's uh, obviously a common task, right? And you can imagine how this would be very useful to be able to recognize and so on. Um, and so because of that, because it would be so useful to recognize churches and other things like uh, cups and dogs and houses and cars and whatever, uh, computer vision people have been uh, looking at this kind of problem for many, many years and it turns out it's very hard to solve until you just use a neural net. Um, but the, tr the way that you can solve it is by trying to take this image and map it into a, tr uh, a feature space, so perform some kind of nonlinear transformation such that the output in the end is a feature space, some vector representation of this image, in which maybe if your goal is to classify cathedrals, all the cathedrals are kind of nicely separated together separated from other stuff like high-rise buildings or whatever you want to, whatever else you want to be able to classify. Um, 
And uh, there has been this saying going around in the vision community, uh, it's the features stupid, which basically means that um, once you have a good representation in such that these points line up nicely, you're kind of done. You know? Because once you are here, there isn't really much more to do. You can take any linear classifier, and then people were kind of uh, religious about using SVMs and such uh, a couple of years ago. But you can use any linear classifier uh, that to, to that, that do a reasonable job once you have those features. And so um, it has become more and more aware over the years that what really matters is this feature extraction pipeline and nothing else, and not the classifier, really, that you apply in the end. Um, so you want to extract good features from this image. You want to get a good representation so that this task becomes easy. That's, that's all this comes down to in the end. And that has been completely underappreciated because if it's just the feature extraction that matters, um, well, it turns out then it's just a neural net that you should use in order to solve this task. Uh, but so people didn't do that, they did other stuff, and so here's kind of a common way how a computer vision person prior 2012 would solve this problem. First of all, over the years people found that almost any information in an image is concentrated in tiny regions in the image. There are very, very strong correlations between nearby pixels, and there are almost no correlations at all between positions that are further away from one another. Um, and so that has been known for a long time, and uh, as a result of that, uh, it has been commonplace to, to uh, extract features in order to get this nice representation by doing something like starting by cropping little patches from the image and then doing some processing on those patches. So everyone has been doing that, and nothing, nothing other than that, <clears throat> just because of this locality of... Uh, of structure in images. Um, so here's a common pipeline that would exploit this. Uh, so what people did was something like this. So you would extract interest points, which is uh, there are key point, so-called key point detectors like SIFT and so on, which would just tell you where would it be worth to look at in order to solve such a task. And so those detectors would then ignore things like sky or stuff that has kind of a homogeneous texture, so you don't expect anything interesting there. And so you would use these methods and get a bunch of points, a cloud of points on your image, and given those positions, you would then uh, crop patches around them uh, in order to, you know, cash in on the fact that information is localized. Uh, and then you would extract features from those patches, and there are also many, many ways of doing that. Uh, you would, for example, use SIFT uh, descriptors for that or other kinds of uh, descriptors that basically turn an image patch into a vector, which is usually a very high dimensional vector of real values of some sort. Um, so there are many things out there, there were thousands of papers on this and uh, many variations and so on. At the end it doesn't really matter what exactly you use, um, as long as this is a fairly high dimensional vector, and then you somehow, you have, now you have a whole bunch of patches, and for each patch you have a vector, and so now your image is represented as this bag of vectors, and that can be a different sized bag for different images, because you might have different numbers of key points that you detect, and so you somehow have to combine them into a single vector, and so the most naive way of combining them is to just add them up, and it turns out that this works pretty well, or worked pretty well by comparison, um, mainly because uh, it has been common to use vectors here for these patches which are very high dimensional and very sparse. And so if these vectors are very sparse, you can imagine that there's almost only zeros in here. And so if there are not many other things than zeros, then adding up a whole bunch of them, a few hundred of them, will lead to very few collisions. Right? And so even the sum is still going to reveal something at the end. Even though whenever two dimensions have the same, uh, have, have a non-zero in them, there's going to be an addition and you're going to lose information of where exactly this number came from. But uh, there are enough cases where you have no or few collisions and so you can still see kind of the information. Um, and so that would give you a representation which, as people found, has this nice property, you know? So you, t you use a linear classifier and can do classification and everything works beautifully. <clears throat> that was until 2012 and 
the only reason I'm bringing this up is in order to sort of reiterate what uh, Wojciech and Russ have been talking about, um, specifically from the perspective of vision, which is to say that nonlinear non processing pipelines are useful and there's no way you will ever solve a task like recognizing a cathedral by doing something other than a multi-step nonlinear pipeline which extracts nice features from the image. There's another way of saying that the representation matters, right? So it's just the representation that you, that you extract from your images which will determine whether you succeed or fail in this task. Um, because of that, deep learning is also called representation learning, as you know, and uh, the main deep learning conference is called ICLR, which is International Conference on Learning Representations. Um, so it's all about extracting representations, and as I said, it has to be a nonlinear processing, because all of this stuff here is nonlinear stuff. If it was just a matrix multiplication, then it just wouldn't work. It's also interesting to just look for a brief moment what those features are that human engineers over the last 20 or 30 years discovered to be useful. So what people discovered is not only that you should use local structure, but the way that you should represent this local structure, so in other words, this part of the pipeline here, oops, this part here, the way that you should represent this little patch here is by Encoding it in terms of local oriented structure. So uh, people use things like so-called Gabor features, for example, so th which look something like this, uh, which basically tell you if in this little patch there has been oriented structures or if kind of things are oriented in a certain way in this little patch. Uh, this is kind of the information that you would like to put into your feature descriptor. And, um, and there, there are probably 50 different ways of doing that, and all of them have been proposed and tried and so on, and all of them kind of work. Um, the SIFT descriptors or Hawk descriptors and, and all kinds of other things basically do that, uh, followed by then some other nonlinear processing. And so what's interesting to note is if you tr just train a neural net on this, it'll also discover the exact same thing. It'll get these kinds of features here and figure out, just like human engineers did, that what you should do to represent an image is uh, describe it in terms of oriented local structure, basically. <coughs> As an aside, these are also closely related to something that's called short-time Fourier transform, um, which is what people use in speech, and lo and behold, in speech, uh, neural nets also discover the same thing. So they, they become very good replacements of human engineers, as you already know. <clears throat> okay, so nonlinear pipelines to get representations are a good thing. And uh, the beautiful thing is that we can just train those nonlinear pipelines and we don't actually have to design them by ourselves anymore. <clears throat> And so the whole field of computer vision is being completely transformed because of that right now. Um, so if you have any questions, just interrupt me at any point in time. Um, not going to take questions just at the end or something. It would be better to just do that kind of uh, along the presentation. So here's a little aside. Uh, of how one can think about why uh, deep learning is taking off so extremely right now. Um, so I said you can get rid of human engineers to build this pipeline for you because the neural net is just going to learn it for you. So that just means set up this pipeline and use training data pairs, input-output pairs, to learn about uh, how, what a good pipeline is. There's another view of what deep learning is, which is much less appreciated in the machine learning community, which is you, can, you do not only, or not only can you get rid of all those engineers understanding the task uh, and learning this processing pipeline, the, the interesting part is, and I think actually the most important part is that you can get rid of those engineers which are gonna make sure that you uh, can run this fast by doing parallelization. Um, 
I think a much more important view of deep learning is a way to automate parallelization rather than a way to automate the, uh, the processing pipeline. So what does that mean? Uh, as you recall, this network here is designed by taking an input vector, x, and multiplying that by a matrix, and then having some element-wise nonlinearities, and then another matrix, and then nonlinearities, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, have you ever wondered why it's designed like this and not in any arbitrary other way that you could design a nonlinear heap pipeline? Uh, in case you wondered, uh, there's a very, very good reason of setting, up, setting it up exactly like this and not in another way, and that's because uh, matrix multipliers are about the, the most parallel kind of computation that you can imagine. Um, so why is that? Uh, so you take, say, let's take an input vector x here and multiply it by this matrix w. Um, what does it mean? So you're going to take, the, get as this value, it's going to be weighted sum of all of these guys, weighted by those connections that you should imagine here right now. And uh, all of these output dimensions can be computed completely independently from one another because they don't depend on, on each other at all. So this is completely parallel across the output units, if you want, if you want to set it up that way. Of course, we are going to do it in the end, because it turns out neural nets don't work unless you parallelize them. Um, but even the computation that this guy does here is completely parallel in itself. Why? Because, as I said, it's going to compute value times weight plus value times weight plus value times weight. So it's just an accumulation of a bunch of element-wise products here, all of which could also be computed at the same time in principle. So matrix multipliers are beautifully parallel, and because of that, you can make them as fast as you want by just giving it enough parallel hardware. So if you have enough compute units, to compute a very, very, very wide matrix product, uh, then you're in good shape because it's just going to be const a constant time computation, basically. Um, and this is because, and then the, the element wise nonlinearity C, of course, are also all parallel and so on. Um, so, this is the reason why deep learning took off in 2012 and not before, because that's the moment where people used GPUs and actually started to cash in on this parallelism. Before that, people tried to simulate neural nets, a beautiful parallel paradigm on CPUs, and were scratching their heads why this didn't take off and why it didn't leap anywhere. Um, so I like to think of deep learning more as a, a way to harness dense parallel computation than to replace engineers that uh, design nonlinear pipelines. But it's of course both of it, because in order to be able to, to harness a dense parallel machine, uh, you have to use learning. Right? Parallelization needs learning. It's a complete, complete mess if you try to, to do without learning. Um, you know about frameworks like MPI and you know, all these things that you have to deal with, race conditions and whatnot, if you want to parallel a computation. It's a complete mess and it requires a lot of engineering. And so the, the idea of deep learning from that perspective is, well, let's just replace that engineering by learning and just, let's just give it a dense parallel machine and let the learning figure out how to optimally use it. That's it. Okay, so there's one technical aspect that I would like to mention um, about uh, training neural nets, which it's a little idea that's used in basically all the actual practical applications of deep learning, uh, in computer vision at least. Uh, so they are used both in convolutional networks and recurrent nets, and I'm sure uh, the other speakers have referred to that, but I would like to rub this in a little more, uh, because this is an, a very important idea, and it's kind of the key idea uh, that makes all of this stuff work. And there's also a caveat. It, it has a disadvantage. It's, it's something that the brain doesn't do for probably good reasons. Um, so that's the idea of weight sharing. Um, just to get an idea, who knows what the weight sharing idea is about from the previous speakers or from your own research? Okay, not many. So, um, so the idea is basically trivial. It says that 
Whenever you like, you can say that a particular parameter in your network um, is allowed to be set to another parameter in the network, uh, which is to say that whenever you like, you can say that you want two parameters to be identical. And um, that is a very, very powerful way to encode structure in your network and that way dramatically reduce the amount of parameters. And this is basically the reason why ConvNets work so well. Um, and it's also the reason why there is such a thing as a recurrent net. Um, the reason this is such a beautiful and simple idea is because you don't actually have to bother. Um, when you're using software frameworks like Theon or Torch, what they're going to do is they're going to allow you to say this weight here is represented, of course, using some floating point value in memory. And they allow you to say things like, I would like these two parameter pointers here to point to the same memory location. And if you do that, and you use gradient descent to train your network, then magically everything's going to be fine. You're going to get the right derivatives and the right updates for these guys, uh, even though they play different roles in the network at the same time. Because of linearity of differentiation and stuff like that, everything kind of works out automatically. Um, and so you, whenever you want, you can just tie weights together and forget about it. And the, the training pipeline and the whole uh, learning machinery is just going to go through without any change. <coughs> so I said there's a caveat, and that is that even though this is a very, very useful engineering way of uh, reducing parameters and networks, and it's the key to making things work, um, it is very, very implausible biologically. Uh, and more importantly, it uh, requires really finicky and annoying long-range communication on the hardware side. Um, so I ta just talked about the beauty of dense parallelization and stuff like that. Right? And so the reason this is nice and useful is because there are companies like NVIDIA that build nice, dense, parallel machines. Um, but all of this breaks down whenever you have to uh, do things like this and uh, distribute weight updates across different parts of a network and stuff like that. Because now these guys have to be synchronized in some way and they have to know about one another. And um, dense, simple parallelism doesn't hold anymore. Right? So it requires logic again. Right? You're back in, in logic land kind of and have to deal with stuff. Um, well, this is automatable, so a software framework will do that for you but it means that it might not be as fast as it could otherwise be. Um, so it's a very powerful idea. It's the key to CNNs and recurrent networks, but it might push us into a local minimum for the next 30 years or something, uh, which we could avoid if we were open to getting rid of these kind of things and doing something that's more like a brain that is truly parallel and doesn't use any weight sharing. Um, but we can't do that because we don't have enough data and uh, we don't yet know how to do unsupervised learning properly and so on. So, um, so there's no hope other than reducing parameters that way. Yes? Excuse me, uh, the, the weight sharing uh, in the CNS is used in the same way. Uh, that's correct, yeah. So this is, yeah, yeah. so this figure, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, yeah, absolutely. So weight sharing in a CNN is usually weight sharing across, across weights in a single layer. And this figure here is weight sharing across layers. Um, this figure is just a, an example uh, of what weight sharing is. And of course it doesn't, weights do not have to be shared within a layer. They can be shared in any way, any parameters. Um, in, a, in a recurrent net, it turns out they are shared across layers. Uh, in a CNN, they are shared within layers, but um, and, and they are shared in very specific ways. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but you could imagine many, many more schemes of sharing weights than just using recurrent nets and convolutional nets um, in order to incorporate knowledge. Any other questions? <coughs> 
So then let's move to convolutional networks, CNNs, which are using weight sharing across a single layer. Um, let's see why they do that and how they do that. And why are they there anyway? Why is that a useful thing to do anyway? So I said weight sharing is a great way to encode prior knowledge. So what is the prior knowledge that they encode? Um, so there are two properties of natural images which are exploitable in a neural net. Um, one is locality and the other is translation invariance. They are somehow subtly related philosophically, deeply probably, um, but from a technical perspective they are very, very separate. So the first is most structure in natural images is local, and so that means, as I said in the beginning, um, if you want to recognize something, like a car, you can do that by almost exclusively focusing on local areas within the image and forgetting about any long-range structure in the image. Um, that is, in order to recognize a car, you can detect certain little pieces, and the pieces always express themselves as local, locally arranged pixel values, um, they never reach far out of a neighborhood. Um, and so after recognizing little pieces, uh, you can combine them and then maybe get larger regions and so on. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you just want to uh, detect local stuff and ignore long-range correlations. And so technically, that means most low-level operations can be based on patches, which is, as I said, what human engineers have found again and again. Um, and neural nets can be made to find that, actually. It's, it's very useful to put that prior knowledge in. And then the other one is position invariance, um, which is to say, if I, so this is a photo I took in Montreal, and so if I hadn't taken it like this, but I had kind of moved the camera ever so slightly to the left, then uh, it would look similar, this image, or maybe not even ever so slightly, but say I moved like by, 10, 20 degrees, uh, then everything would have moved, have been displaced here, but the content of the image, except for the stuff that would come in here on the border, uh, would pretty much be the, exactly the same. There wouldn't be any change. Um, so sh shifting the image around is not going to change anything at all. And uh, so that means I can extract local structure in little patches, but where exactly that structure occurred is completely irrelevant. Uh, that same structure might occur at a different position. <clears throat> and so you can extend the idea of operating on local patches towards the idea of uh, operating, uh, performing the same operations everywhere, at every patch, basically. And it's really just translation invariance. It's just, it's just because I can take pictures in any way in any exact kind of position. And so that leads to convolutional networks, which uh, I'm sure some uh, the, other, the, the other speakers have talked about a little bit, um, which kind of basically is just a neural net with a couple of layers that puts in these two constraints. So it uses local features, and it applies the same feature at many different positions. So local features means that you have hidden units going from the input to the first hidden layer, which do not look at the whole image, but only at the tiny patch in the input image. And um, then the second idea is, if you have a hidden unit which looks at this little patch over here, then you will also want to have another hidden unit which looks at this patch over here using the same features. And as soon as you do that, it's convenient to um, arrange all your responses of your hidden units. I'm not sure about how I should exactly talk into this microphone without uh, messing up the recording. So, Is this actually loud enough or should I focus more on it? Yeah, because I noticed that my... Uh, the, the the vol volume kind of changes as I move around, but I guess, okay. Um, so once you have the idea of using the same feature everywhere, you can then arrange all your responses in a, in a, in a set of responses that you just, uh, that just form an image it themselves, right? Because I just apply the same transformation everywhere. So I'm gonna arrange my hidden units just as if they form an image. And since I have many different features I would, apply, I would like to apply everywhere, I can put them in planes, which is then called a feature map. 
So the result of the first layer is just a stack of other images, each of which is just a filtered version of the input image. Um, so, but at the end of the day, you would like to have a classifier here. So usually you, you do that multiple steps and then uh, and use some sublane sampling in between and then have some fully connected layers maybe or maybe not in the end. Um, but at the end of the day, you would want to have a classification decision here, which just tells you something about the whole image, of course. And, uh, but if you base your operations on only patches, so if you feed only patches into the image, uh, in, sorry, into the network, then uh, those responses are not going to see the whole image. Right? You're going to have a whole bunch of local guys that don't know anything about one another. And so because of that, you just add these subsampling layers in there, which will take a set of responses in some region here and pool them together in some way. And uh, often you use pooling schemes like max pooling or average pooling, which is kind of not learned, but you could also imagine learning that. So, so the basic idea is that uh, since everything is local and you want a global decision in the end, you're going to have to combine that local stuff somehow. So let's just kind of pool across larger and larger regions as we go up the network. And so there are many, many ways of designing such a network, uh, and there are many variations out there, and it doesn't really matter in the end. They all kind of work, as long as you base your operations on local transformations and use weight sharing um, uh, to use the same feature all over the place. Um, and then you can have subsampling or no subsampling or various kinds of subsampling and have various numbers of layers and all kinds of variations. And people are playing with these kinds of architecture and it's not clear yet which one is the best and the most sensible. The, the standard mantra of deep learning here holds as well, which is the deeper and the, the bigger and deeper the better. Uh, but um, what exact choices you should be making is not at all clear because it takes so long to train these networks. Um, the standard reference is a paper from 1998, even though these networks have been around quite a bit longer. Just uh, Le Carre and others, 1998. I'm going to get back to that paper because that also introduced another idea, entirely unrelated, which is also being used a lot. <coughs> Much less known. Okay, so let's dwell a little bit on this idea of weight sharing and local features and so on. Uh, here is what happens when you train a neural net on images, just a neural net without any local features and weight sharing. <coughs> so let's take images like uh, this here, CIFA, um, which are 32 by 32 in color. So there are three color channels there. That's 32 by 32 by three, so that's around 3,000 numbers that will represent an image here, the 3,000 dimensional vector. What's interesting to notice, when you train no matter what network or no matter which task, and you look at the features that this network learns, right, the weights going from the image into a hidden unit in the first layer, they will always look something like this. It's completely unavoidable. You will always get these Gaborish features here, which are localized Fourier components if you want. Um, and as I said, humans found them to be useful because what they essentially do is detect oriented structure in an image. Um, in fact, if you train a network on some task and you get something that doesn't look like this, like this panel on the right, you can almost be sure that your network is not going to work sort of a debugging tool, you know, look at the fe features in the first layer and if they are Gabor features, then your network has probably succeeded. Um, so the reason though I'm showing this image here is because I want to highlight something else, which is these so-called Gabor features are local Fourier components, so they also discover or re re reflect the fact that structure and images is local, and that means that they contain almost only zeros. So everything that's gray here is basically a zero in these, in these pictures. And um, so they have this little wavy pattern that they learn in order to detect oriented structure. And then they're surrounded by an ocean of zeros, basically. Um, what a waste, uh, both 
computationally and statistically, because the, the more parameters you're gonna have, you, you have to learn, the more data you're gonna need. And uh, if you already know that, you wanna have, that you're gonna have so many zeros, then why even bother using these large features, right? So this is kind of the main idea behind convolutional networks. Um, but let's do, let's do a little back of the envelope computation of the number of features that we're gonna need in order to train our little fully connected network on CIFAR. Um, a reasonable choice for the number of hidden units, kinda, uh, in most cases, whenever you train a network on any kind of task, is that you should use on at least on the order of the number of input dimensions as the number of hidden units in the first layer. It's sort of, everyone does that. Well, actually, everyone doesn't do that. What everyone does is use many more hidden units. Right? Usually, you find that the, the more overcomplete you go, the better you're off and the better your network is going to work. So if you have 3,000 inputs, picks, so if every image here has 3,000 dimensions, you should use probably something like, I don't know, 15,000 or 30,000 hidden. But let's start with something reasonable, which is take the same number. So we have a complete basis. Right? Let's say we also use 3,000 hidden. Well, so if we just use a small network that only has as many input dimensions as uh, hidden units as input dimensions, you're going to have 3,000 input, 3,000 hidden, and so in order to get to the hidden layer, you're going to need 3,000 times 3,000 parameters, that matrix that maps your 3,000 dimensional vector to the 3,000 dimensional hidden. So you're going to have 9 million parameters right there for the first layer. And that is, so 9 million parameters in order to treat tiny, tiny images uh, of size 32 by 32 pixels. And now you could add another hidden layer and another one, so you're easily in the tens or hundreds of millions range for an ex extremely toy task dealing with tiny images. If you would use a reasonable representation, not a complete one, but an overcomplete one, you would easily be in the billions of parameters right there. Which is uh, crazy because you're gonna need a lot of data and it's gonna take a lot of time and you need a big GPU or ideally multiple GPUs and so on. absolutely crazy and so um, oh, here's the number <laughs> coming late um, let's compare that with confnets just uh, for the fun of it so you have to remember that a confnet has as parameters <coughs> the number of pixels in your input patch right times the number of hidden units uh, that you want to use here, so the number of planes that you're going to get in the end. Right? So, uh, and, no, sorry, it, so the number of pixels in the input patch, but you have to recall that the input patch here can also be a multi-dimensional object, right? So since we're dealing with color images typically, we're going to have RGB planes, and so it's convenient to think of your input image as a number of pixels horizontally, number of pixels vertically, times number of color planes, right? Always think of an image as a 3D tensor of floating point numbers. And so the parameters that you need is a little block, right? So if you crop a little patch, you still want to go across all color channels. So you get a little block as the input, and that gets mapped uh, to a hidden unit here. And if you want to have multiple hidden units, you have a number of hidden units as the additional num number of parameters, right? So what a confinet does, it maps a tensor to a tensor. Or what one layer of a confinet map does, it maps a tensor to a tensor. It maps a 3D image block to another image block and uh, the f the, those channels are color in the beginning and then they are just the hidden responses later on. And uh, since you're al already talking about those tensors, from now on everything just stays the same. I'm just going to map 3D image blocks to 3D image blocks throughout the network. Is that clear or is that confusing to anyone? Yes? Uh, what, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So that's because of that. Is oh, okay. So in the input layer, in the input image, you have multiple layers because of color or depth or for whatever reason, because you're using multi-spectral images, whatever. Um, but then you're going to use multiple hidden units, and the way this is set up is that you have these multiple planes because every hidden unit is going to get applied all over the place, right? So it's convenient to arrange them as an image, 
And now you have multiple hidden units, though. You don't want to just apply one transformation, one matrix, uh, sorry, one vector, but you want to have a whole matrix, but you want to have a whole hidden layer that does different transformations of the image. And so you can stack them into these planes. And this whole thing is called a feature map. But that's nothing other than an image, if you want, that has more channels or less channels, whatever, except that channels now means hidden unit, hidden units, hidden unit responses or something. Um, but it's just another stack of images, right? So color, a color image is a stack of three gray value images where the three gray planes just represent uh, different colors. And uh, this image here is just a, another multi-channel image where the different channels represent something more abstract that the network is gonna figure out. Um, but it's in, in any case, an image is a 3D block of floating point numbers because of the channel idea. Is that clear? Um, okay, so the, but what I was actually going to do is count the number of parameters. So um, what is the number of parameters then if you have this tensor to tensor operation idea? So what are we going to have to count? Well, uh, what is the number of parameters? It's going to be the number of pixels in this direction times the number of pixels in this direction times the number of channels in this image. That's going to be a vector of parameters that does an inner product to get one response. But now we don't only want to have, want to have one response, we want to have k responses because we want to have k different hidden units. And then the fact that the neighboring, like for this guy, there are all these neighboring guys here, all of those are going to disappear in terms of parameter counts because, as we said, we are just going to apply the same transformation on all of things. So we really have nothing other than number of pixels, number of pixels, number of planes times number of planes here. That's the number of parameters. That's with weight sharing. But just for the sake of the argument, let's get rid of the weight sharing for a second. Um, let's just look at the number of parameters without weight sharing so that we are not going to say all of these units across this image are going to use the same transformation, but each one of them is allowed to use a different transformation. That's actually maybe not such a bad idea because we still cash in on parameter reduction, but without weight sharing, we don't have this messy long-range communication problem. And so maybe this would even make that much better to hardware and so on. Okay, so without weight sharing, you're gonna have uh, a reasonable feature size might be something like 10 by 10. So you'll have 10 by 10 by three for color, uh, which is 3072 times um, a reasonable number of hidden might be the same, right? So it might be, uh, uh, well, it might be not the same because uh, that would be a fully connected net, but now we can use much less. Um, so we get something like a million parameters if we use an over complete, uh, sorry, if we use a complete representation, if we use the same number of hidden as the inputs. And that's just because every hidden unit here doesn't have this ocean of zeros surrounding the Gabor feature. Right? So. So what we get rid of by comparison to the fully connected net if we don't use weight sharing is uh, 32 by 32 by 3 turns into 10 by 10 by 3, which is just uh, 300 as opposed to 3000. So we get an order of magnitude better, right? We get 1 million parameters versus 9 million in that case. Um, which is kind of nice, it's a lot of magnitude, but it's not extreme. Um, what if you use weight sharing as well, then rather than having this and 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 this, a separate hidden unit with its own parameters, uh, all of these would have the same parameter, so you will get rid of a ton of stuff in addition. Um, in fact, if you have 100 hidden units here only, you still get these gigantic feature maps, so you still get a lot of hidden units in the end. Um, but if you just have 100 planes here, you will get something like 10 by 10 by 3 by 100, which is something like 30,000 parameters. And that's already extremely overcomplete because for 100 hidden units, each hidden unit gives you a whole plane 
So you get tons of responses per hidden unit parameter vector. Um, and so you're ex extremely overcomplete, but you only have 30,000 parameters. By comparison to 9 million. And so it's, uh, it's just not comparable at all. It's an absolutely dramatic difference uh, in, in the number of parameters. So what is the number of hidden units if we just use 100 feature maps? Well, it's 100 times, and per hidden unit we get this plane, and that plane is 32 by 32, it's the size of an image. So it's down here, right? It's 32 by 32 by 100, so it's something like 10,000. So we have 100 different kinds of features in our parameter set, and we get 10,000 responses for that. Um, and that, so we get an extremely overcomplete code, right? We get an extremely, extremely overcomplete representation for almost no parameters whatsoever. Um, and that is sensible because when we use an overcomplete code and we just train a fully, com uh, fully uh, connected network, we often see things like uh, this, here, right? You see this feature of, let's, uh, well, let's look at this one and this one. Um, they are basically the same, but they're just displaced. And one of the reasons you have to get go over complete empirically, which is what everyone found, is that you will probably want to have all these features represented at many different positions, because all the same things can happen all over the place. Um, so that's why we find that in practice we want to be extremely over complete. And, uh, the network discovers that as well, but then we can just put that information in and get rid of a whole, whole stack of zeros in terms of the number of parameters. <clears throat> Clear? Okay, so that is a nice idea and it sort of worked for several 20 years or so. Um, but it never really took off, and it never competed with those engineered pipelines that people used before. Until in 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton and some students in Toronto just decided, let's finally implement a confnet on a GPU. And uh, after they did that, as many of you know, that was a complete change in the field, and now computer vision is basically nothing other than uh, training confnets on various tasks. And so that whole frenzy kicked off in 2012 when uh, the ImageNet challenge took place. Uh, so there were a lot of pipelines that people introduced. I'm not sure that might be too small to read, but you get the typical kind of vision -y stuff happening here. So uh, things like SIFT plus Fisher vectors and GIST plus Fisher vectors and other Fisher vectors and SVMs and LBP. And these are all uh, descriptors that I showed in the beginning. Ways to turn a little image patch into a vector, which turns out to be so useful after all. Um, in this challenge, you have around a million images and you want to classify them. Well, there are various variations and one of the challenges into, you want to classify them into thousand classes and uh, the performance that people got was something like 30 and then 28, 27, 26. So things got slowly better over time and putting in another Fisher vector and another, another SIFT descriptor then improved things again and so on. So it was a whole messy kind of engineering field. And uh, so then they implemented confidence on GPUs and trained them and, uh, well, which enabled them, first of all, to train them uh, on this large data set. And they immediately got to 16% in that challenge in 2012. And that was a big, sho uh, yeah, big, sh <coughs> big shock to the computer vision community and changed everything, basically. When I say 16% and 26% and so on, what I mean is so-called top five error rate, um, which just says, uh, well, the, the problem with this challenge is that there are lots of ambiguities in your classes. So sometimes you're not really sure what you're looking at. And you could say it's either this or that. But the network has to make a decision. And so rather than just taking classification decision, people decided to, or the community decided to converge on this kind of looser evaluation scheme, which is top five. In your top five predictions, that you get the, the correct label. Um, but anyway, it's just a number that you can assign to these networks and see how well they do and compare them and so on. 
And so going from 26 after things were going really slowly, suddenly to 16 is an extremely big change. And, uh, and the, if you look at the model description itself, it's just saying uh, using extra training data or using only supply training data. There wasn't really anything else in there to talk about because there wasn't a new fancy descriptor or something. It was just a confident trained on EGP. Um, and then, as usual, when you look at the low-level features, you, you get these Gabor structures, so the network nicely figures out how to become a vision engineer and figures out what the features it should, uh, are that it should be using, and so on. Um, and of course, there are not many zeros here, and they are not very small, because the human engineering here went into the localization and the weight sharing. It's a convnet. And so now you can exploit the whole feature here because you're going to get scanned over the whole image. Um, and on the bottom of this slide, I'm also showing some, some of the classification results back then. Things got way better since then, but um, it was already very exciting to see that you would be able to uh, do retrieval of similar images and do classification performance in a reasonable way. And of course, this is a very useful task, right? uh, except that until then, there was just no solution. Right? It was sort of working, but not really working. And since then, it started to really work and to end the topic of object classification in some sense as a, as a research problem. Because uh, it's now, two, years, two and a half years later, it's basically done. Uh, we, we, there's not much more to do on this data set because it's basically within the human accu accuracy, you know, human agreement uh, of labeling. So there's not really anything else to do here. We're done. Um, which is, even that is a little bit unexpected. Even to deep, deep learning believers, this has been a little bit of an unexpected, unexpected thing. So um, Jeff Hinton, at the, actually, is that the same year or maybe a few months after that? Um, at a workshop claimed that, so I was giving a talk and I mentioned that I, what I think are the next important challenges, what should we be doing and so on, and I kind of, you know, naively said, yeah, now that ImageNet is, uh, now that we have 16% on ImageNet, maybe in two, three years we're going to have something like 5% or 6%, and uh, problem is out, it doesn't exist anymore, so we should be focusing on other things now, on the next computer vision challenge or something, other tasks. And then uh, Jeff Hinton came and said, no, 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 this is not going to happen. I mean, 16 is already amazing, but we're never going to get, or like, the next 20 years or something, we're not going to get down to like below 10 or whatever, because uh, it is still a pretty hard uh, task and so on. But it turns out he was also wrong, uh, because in 2014, Google came with their Google Net, which is just a bigger version of a ConvNet. It has more layers, and it plays some tricks with cross-channel pooling and so on. Um, and they actually got to 6%, which was also actually a, quite a surprise to everyone. And uh, recently they came up with a very neat trick that they call batch normalization, that no one really understands at this point completely, uh, to make them train better, essentially. And uh, they go get below 5%, which, as I said, is kind of what people assume is the, the, the agreement among humans on this task. Um, so you cannot really get better than that on this data set. Um, Cross-channel pooling, that just means that you do not just use pooling in your confnet that goes, subsampling that goes across the image, but you also have some hidden units over here which will pool across planes here, which seems like a reasonable idea to put in there. And, uh, but they had all the other kinds of bells and whistles in this network. And it's very hard to explore this kind of network because it trains very long and uh, you cannot wait and you cannot, you're already parallelizing to make it uh, train in that case, actually, because it's Google. Um, but you cannot parallelize more in order to do hyperparameter evaluation. You cannot kind of launch a hundred different of these networks and just pick the best or something. So you just have to settle with some setup and they came up with this graph and some tricks and set some values and then just roll with it and hope it's going to work. And in this case it works well. The good news of course is that all of these changes that you could imagine doing in your confident are usually very robust. So if you change the number of hidden units uh, in some uh, block here over here from uh, whatever, 200 to 100 or something, I can guarantee you that it's going to make hardly any difference in the final result. Awesome. Um, 
So that's useful. Another trick that they used, and that's important to know about, is uh, these extra labels that they put in. So typically, you train a network by putting in the data on the bottom and going through the net and then having a classification decision which gives you a loss and then training it. What they did, they put it, the labels also in intermediate stages in order to help lower layers train better. That, that's sort of the reasoning because now they already get label information and maybe that's going to make them suffer less from vanishing gradients and whatnot. I would still like to get a sense of uh, people's familiarities here. Who has read this paper? <laughs> and so then we discovered uh, confidence work and so everyone jumped on it, on the bandwagon. and. Uh, through confidence into whatever challenge or tasks you had. This is a challenge that we won in Montreal. I just have to give you just one random example here, uh, which is emotion recognition from videos. You see little snippets of Hollywood movies or something like that, and you're supposed to say whether that scene reflects uh, a sentiment that is angry or happy or sad or something. And uh, we threw, of course, after this, we threw confidence into the mix uh, it turns out that was the most important thing we had to do in order to win this challenge. And, um, and, and it's, it makes it easy to win this challenge because you immediately get a gigantic boost in performance. And so this is a bit tricky because this is video and uh, at that point it wasn't really clear how to generalize confidence to video. Actually, it's still not clear how to properly generalize confidence to video, but you can do things like look at isolated frames. Right? In a video, even a single frame is going to reveal a lot about that video, and especially when it comes to something like sentiment classification. And uh, so it turns out that if you just do that and then somehow combine across frames, works. And uh, there's still many, many open questions of how to probably do that, but just having a confident in the mix is incredibly useful uh, to solve this kind of task. Video is unfortunately tricky in general because of the sheer amount of data. Right? Images are already gigantic. Uh, so as I said, a tiny, tiny image has something like 3,000 dimensions. A reasonable image, uh, like 10 or 100 times that much. And video, in video you have another multiplier of 10 or 100 because of the time. Uh, what's also messy about videos is they can have different length, typically and it might not be sensible to stretch or squeeze the video to make it fit uh, a fixed frame rate. For images, in fact, people do that a lot, right? So if you have an image that you want to put into a confident for classification, the best thing to do is just resize it, just outright, just make it shape into whatever ever it has to be so it fits into that confinet. And if that confinet is something like 230 by 230, and you just make your image 230 by 230, it's going to lead to awful distortions, but it's usually going to work pretty well. So there's a, a huge amount of robustness. With video, if you have a confinet that looks at uh, 100 frames of video, that's probably not going to work because, or, well, whatever size it is, because videos might very drastically from something like 10 to 1,000 frames, and then uh, you might get extreme distortions or something like that. Um, so video is tricky, and it's also a ton of data. The, the standard, the MNIST of video is called Hollywood 2, which is uh, also little snippets of Hollywood movies, and you are supposed to classify activities like uh, jumping, running, answering the phone, and stuff like that. And uh, that data set is the MNIST because it's tiny. It has like a few hundred examples per class, and there are a handful of classes. So it's terrible to do any research. It's kind of completely unsensible because it's too, too small to tell anything. Um, but even just that data set has a few hundred gigabytes of memory that it occupies on your disk when you have it lying around. So, um, so video is tricky. Um, nevertheless, there is a whole lot of research going on in video, applying conflicts to video. Um, and people are still trying to figure out what's the right way to do that. Uh, you can use something like 3D generalization of convolution. So convolution is something like scanning a filter across the image, 
which is why they are called convolutional network, but it's just weight sharing. And now you could do the same thing in 3D and scan kind of 3D blocks in 3D across your video or something. Um, but there are other things you can try, like com condensing information in some other way temporarily and so on. And uh, there are many papers out there, and it's, as I said, it's not clear what's the right way to do. I think the, the most advanced type of video processing recurrent net out there currently and, and fairly recent is this C3D model from Facebook and I think NYU. Was NYU involved in that in some way? I guess? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it's uh, basically Facebook and uh, they came up with, they trained a gigantic network on, uh, across various tasks of video classification, uh, like classification, classifying things from videos <coughs> and, uh, and then also use those features across a whole bunch of tasks and so on. And um, they trained something like a week on a GPU or so, and I think they just stopped because uh, at some point you're gonna have to stop. Um, but it's just, video is just different, and it's just hard, and it takes time, and so on. Um, and they do a very nice job, they have videos online where you can see how they classify uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, sports one million data set, which is sports activities uh, uh, in many different classes. And it works pretty well, and so on. Um, there's still a tricky issue with all of this video stuff, which is, as I said, you can often infer the class by just looking at a single frame. And for those sports videos, it's often the case. You, you just see one frame, you see it's soccer. You, know, you don't need to see a video. You, don't, you need to recognize motion or something like that. And so that makes it even more tricky to solve it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about extracting proper motion and things like flow from multiple images uh, in my second talk later on. Um, and then uh, another thing from also Rob Fergus and, and the NYU guys or Facebook guys is uh, where they uh, took an image and rather than trying to classify objects or something, they classify something <coughs> like depth. If, so if you have a data set of an image paired with a depth map that tells you the depth profile of, uh, of that scene, then you can train it up uh, and ask the network to predict that instead, of course. Um, and, uh, and there are such data sets, and there are also nicer data sets like surface normal. So they tell you for every pixel, there might be a surface like this, and they tell you what is the direction of the surface at that position. And so now you can imagine a network that will output what is the direction of the surface, the orientation of the surface, everywhere in the image. And you get a whole maps of those, which you can visualize maybe using color for different orientations or whatever. And they showed that it works pretty nicely, and they also played some tricks uh, in order to make this work. One of the tricks they had to do is they use multi-scale, so they have a network that starts with a low-resolution version of the image, makes its opinions about those pixels, and then gets fed into a higher resolution, and then even higher resolution other network, which kind of refines those decisions. And doing that allows them to get a reasonably, a reasonable, sorry, a reasonably smooth output in the end, uh, that doesn't suffer from noise so much and so on. Right? Because you can imagine it's a harder task to, pre to make a prediction about a surface normal at every single pixel and having all those decisions agree somewhat rather than just coming up with a label like car as the output of the network. So, but in general, the reason I'm showing this is because uh, people are now extending this idea of uh, feeding data <coughs> images into neural nets, uh, in into many other uh, computer vision domains. Any questions? <coughs> Time-wise, I'm going to have to stop at 11, is that so, or 10.30? Okay, all right. I'll try to hurry a little bit. Um, you can analyze what the features look like, and uh, people are playing with that idea, so you can look at higher neurons somewhere high up in your hierarchy and look what kind of features do they actually extract? It's not so easy to do, but it's not because it's not trivial to invert that transformation from that, from that hidden unit down to pixels, right? And it's also not easy in principle because it's a many-to-one mapping. So you can have many different images that I show you here, which lead to the same response over here. And now the question is, if I ask what is this unit gonna respond to, like what do you even mean and stuff? Uh, so, but there's a, one way of uh, visualizing what a neuron here does, which is show me the images in the training data or validation data set uh, to which this neuron up here responds the most. Right? What does this neuron like to see the most? What makes it excited? 
And uh, so if you do that, then you see things like uh, uh, neurons that respond to a person somewhere in a specific position of the image, or those that respond to a dog face, or, uh, or shiny, just something shiny in some region, you know, uh, which can be any like thing where some light that uh, that gets some light uh, shined onto it, and so on. And so they're becoming, they're turning into fairly sophisticated uh, feature extractors. Right? They extract pretty abstract, complicated stuff from the image, and uh, that's it kind of a dream for a computer vision researcher because it's it's not. It's not easy to get a detector that just detects faces and so on, or uh, dogs or something. And this just emerges somewhere in the network in order to solve the classification task that you're dealing with all by itself. And uh, that is an important thing to do because um, it's actually now, and I think this is probably the biggest, the most important aspect of all of this, it's now the case that people train a network on ImageNet and then use this amazing feature extraction capability in order to solve, solve completely different tasks using that very ImageNet network. And um, so one of the first papers in that direction was uh, Donahue and others, uh, you know, I think Berkeley, um, where they showed that if you take a ConvNet, like any ConvNet trained on ImageNet, and you look at the penultimate layer, so the, the last layer of your network before you go on classification, and you just use those as features. So image in, last layer response out, and you just call that a feature vector for the image, which is something like another SIFT descriptor. So people used SIFT or whatever for images, and now they say let's use a confident as a feature extractor. Uh, so they show that if you do that, then you get a, a surprisingly rich and useful representation, <coughs> even on completely other tasks than ImageNet. Um, so they call this particular one decaf. And here's a visualization in 2D of the features that you get uh, on some task, which in this case is, uh, I don't know what exactly it is, structure, bird, whatever. Um, which is not ImageNet. And so if you use something like LLC, which is like a linear feature transformation, a sparse coding kind of thing, or GIST, which is basically the same as SIFT, uh, or some other stuff, uh, it, the classes don't, nearly, don't separate nearly as nicely as when using a DCAF, which is their ConvNet feature, top layer ConvNet feature, or maybe not top layer, but maybe some lower layer, whatever. Um, and so here's another example. Uh, you get a very good separation across classes, even for a task like uh, scene recognition, um, where you have classes like outdoor man-made, outdoor natural, indoor, indoor man-made, and whatnot. Um, so the network figures out what the difference is between an indoor scene, like here, and an outdoor scene, like over there on the street, even though it has never been trained on that explicitly. So these are very good feature extractors. And that is very important because you do not have data sets for those other tasks. You might want to ask, well, if you want to do C classification, why don't you train a system on a clean C classification task? Well, guess what? There is no data set for C classification, which is nearly as big enough to train a continent on it. Um, there are data sets, but they are so, so tiny that you can maybe train a linear classifier, but that's about it. And so now, because of this general, generality of those features, we have a way of extracting features which are going to solve that other task. And you actually only have to train your linear classifier because you can use the powerful ConvNet trained on ImageNet as a feature extract. Um, getting those labeled data sets is very hard. It's a very big effort. And that's why this is actually a very important thing uh, to happen. And I think this is sort of where everyone is moving right now. Um, I'm going to get back to that in, in a few moments. Um, and there have been studies, actually, uh, numerical studies of how well they actually generalize. And so the picture in general is, uh, this is another paper uh, from, from recently, uh, by some European authors. Uh, and the general finding is it just works, right? Confident features are very good. And you can do all kinds of improvements, like, like fine-tuning your network on the actual task, or rather than just using those features and so on, and maybe improve things. But the bottom line is, Confident features just work out of the box, even across different tasks. Here's a nice example of uh, an application of this to uh, a completely different task, 
than even uh, object or scene recognition. This is recognizing image style, like uh, expressionism, impressionism, rococo uh, baroque, or whatever. Or on the left, you have things like minimal um, high dynamic range or noir or whatever so photographic style you want to be able to detect. You can imagine that this, is, this can be very useful in uh, various websites, uh, photo sharing sites and stuff like that. And it actually can give rise to a much better kind of image search than what you're currently used to doing. Rather than typing in, uh, I'm looking for images of a dog, you can look for an image of a dog or a house uh, in a kind of style that you really care about for your current purpose, right? So for example, imagine you're looking for an image of a flower. Uh, well, depending on uh, typing into Google flower, it's maybe going to be fine, but maybe you want to distinguish between f flowers uh, that are kind of geometric structures that are drawn or something versus uh, particular kinds of flower or flowers because you want to use it on some greeting card for a wedding or whatever, in which case you may, might want to have it a romantic image of the flower and so on. Right? So having a much uh, more fine-grained classification into styles and, and these kind of things can be very useful. Uh, here's another example of dress, which can be, which can look very different. You, you might want to expect very different responses depending on what context you search this in. So all of these things now becoming possible thanks to basically a convnet trained on ImageNet uh, opens up many, many doors in terms of applications and uh, business cases, of course. Just to dwell a little bit longer on this sharing idea, right? Uh, so this is, actually a, this is actually an example of transfer learning. Um, because, right, we, we train on one task, ImageNet, and then we use part of that network on another task, like classifying photographic style. Um, and that turns out to work extremely well. What doesn't work well at all yet is unsupervised learning, where you just take images, train something like an autoencoder or RBM or something like that, and have it extract features from the images without ever seeing any labels. Even though there are, there's a lot of research in this, and I have done some research in this and so on, this is, hasn't gone anywhere. Like, there are no applications almost of this. At least no applications that are anywhere near the, the amazing performance of these continents on trained on image net. Um, so transfer learning works. Unsupervised learning doesn't work, basically, currently. It's the state of affairs. And, uh, no one is, everyone is a little bit confused because of that, because everyone was hoping that we would be able to do unsupervised learning, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. The whole field is kind of not moving. It's, it just doesn't work. And at the same time, transfer learning is just so amazing, uh, which kind of lets people to question this whole unsupervised learning agenda. Maybe we shouldn't try to train a network to understand images by themselves at all, even. Maybe we should only have tasks, and maybe many different tasks, such that we get good feature extractors and can then generalize to other tasks. Um, in some sense, this is what kids do, right? So um, a, a standard argument for unsupervised learning is what people bring up all over the time again and again. If you have a child and it sees a dog the first time and the mom says, this is a dog, from then, that moment on, that child can recognize all dogs. So there is no need to give a million, a uh, couple hundred training examples to that child. Um, and so then you can turn that into an argument for unsupervised learning by saying, how other than having learned on pure images would that child have learned that? But I would argue now, in 2015, after all these disappointments, that maybe it's not actually a set of unlabeled images that the child utilized in order to solve this task. Maybe it's a whole bunch of other tasks that the child had and other sources of information that the child get, got, right? For example, um, what are the things that the child will have to do? Well, it has to do all kinds of everyday things, like moving things around, uh, getting rid of stuff that are in its way, not bump into things by walking around, and all of these things. Right? These are all tasks, and they give you nice reinforcement signals in, in order to function in the world. And uh, these are tasks, and not just a flow of images that you are trying to reconstruct in some way, and right? that you're learning about uh, uh, by yourself. 
And so maybe it's this set of higher level tasks that drive the learning, in which case you could argue it's not actually unsupervised learning, it's transfer learning that enables children to do these amazing, amazing feats of uh, learning with very little labeled data. So at the end of the day, it's not very little labeled data. It's a ton of labeled data, but it's many different tasks, everyday tasks that you have to solve. All of this is philosophy, uh, and no one knows where this is going to go, but it might just be that uh, transfer learning will, in the end, overtake unsupervised learning. And uh... Okay, but there's also a practical side to this. Um, so these guys at Google, they built uh, Google Net, and it's a very nice network, and that solves that, at least that image net classification challenge. That should make you wonder, when you take a different kind of problem and you are in a company or in a university and you're trying to build a network to solve a certain task, does it really make sense to put in a confnet and train it up and kind of solve the problem? It doesn't really seem to, because if you want to do a really good job, you should at least be as good as those Google Net guys for your confnet module. And maybe you're not after training confnets for classification, but you want to have a description, a caption generation, or you don't want to do anything, a robot that has to do stuff, whatever. Um, so, but it's going to have a confident as a module, almost certainly, if you want to have any kind of visual input to it. Uh, so then the question is, should you really be putting in a confident and then training your system if Google needed a whole bunch of people, well, two at least, to build this Google Net, and they needed a couple of weeks of training it and so on, and it's lying there, and you can download it, you can basically use it if you want to, um, or any other network. I'm just mentioning GNET as one random example, of course. Right? There's also GGNet and there are tons of others that are just lying out there, and you can just take them and use them. And so given that you can generalize across tasks so nicely, it doesn't seem sensible to retrain a system, waste a couple of weeks of cycles of learning, just to train up your vision part of your system, plus another couple of weeks to train all the other parts, if that little piece of brain, if you want, that visual system is sitting there and you can just use it. Right? So this is very, very different. And this gives us a huge edge over evolution, because evolution wasn't really able to do something like that. Right? We can share our models. You can build an almost perfect visual pathway that goes from retina to something like V4. And it just works, and it generalizes across all kinds of tasks. It's just a very, very good model of the human visual system, if you want. And you just have it lying around on the internet, you can just use it. So why should we replicate that? And so because of that, I think a huge trend is going to be more sharing of networks across people, across communities, across uh, tasks. And so Okay, let me move to a completely different topic. Um, the last five minutes, and we'll see where to. Oh, it's a bit more. Yeah, so how long did we have? Now? Yeah, so I can go through this fairly quickly, I think. And then, that way I'm going to wrap up the continent story and then we'll move to other stuff. So it doesn't matter if we go a little bit over, I suppose, right? A couple of minutes. Structure prediction. So I mentioned the task taking an image and outputting pixels, labeling every pixel or something like that. So, uh, that's different than this task here, which is classification, where you want to take an image X and give me a class. Uh, so the, the, the class is just a homogeneous label, it's just one out of thousand. Whereas structure prediction means you want to output a bunch of things at the same time. Why is that difficult? Um, that's difficult because if you have, say, binary labels that you want to predict, then you get a combinatorial explosion of things that you can represent here. Right? So if this is binary, you're going to have two to the k things combinations of predictions. So predicting a vector rather than a single thing is harder, much, much, much harder than just predicting one out of k things. Does everyone agree with that? So what is the standard trick of uh, resolving this issue? It's to impose a dependency structure on your outputs. You just claim there would be some kind of structure. Often this is wrong, 
but you do it anyway because now it becomes tractable. And um, usually it works fairly well nevertheless. So, for example, you could say, let's just pretend that these output units here form a chain, for example, rather than independent units. And uh, it turns out that you can use things like dynamic programming in order to inference this kind of thing. There are many applications of this in, in NLP, actually, but uh, in vision uh, it's also natural because these things can be literally things like pixels. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm not sure how far this is going to go. This is a very, very active research uh, area of research in computer vision and other areas, so it's important to mention it and know about. Personally, I'm a little bit concerned that this might all be wiped away by the use of recurrent nets, which operate on your output and learn what they have to do by themselves. But currently, uh, people are, are using this kind of idea quite a lot. And so uh, what's interesting about this is that it has been proposed a long time ago and in fact, it has been proposed in the paper here by Lecun in 1998 that also introduced ConvNets, interestingly. Uh, so they also proposed a solution to this problem uh, of predicting many things at the same time. It's a completely independent idea. It has nothing to do whatsoever with ConvNets. It's just saying if you have multiple labels you want to predict, a good solution is to impose a dependency structure. So just say they are a chain, for example, and then use uh, dynamic programming, basically, to solve this problem. Um, so that's to say your neural network doesn't only have to output some, like an independent thing, but it can output graphs, complicated graphs. And what they show is that backprop in this network is still going to work. You can still train this thing. Um, that idea was then recycled, actually, a few years after that. It was given a new name. So basically, there, uh, there were other researchers who came up with a special case of this, uh, where this neural net here isn't a neural net, but it's just one layer. So the whole thing is linear, and then they called that conditional random field and showed also that that works. But it's basically, it, a conditional random field is a special linear special case of the neural net version of this, which was proposed actually quite a long time before that. Um, <clears throat> now the term conditional random field has kind of made its way in the community, and everyone calls these things conditional random fields. But it's interesting to note that they were introduced in 1998 at the same time as confidence in the same paper, basically. <clears throat> so the main idea is that you define, so you define scores to the classification, right? So imagine you have a score function that takes an input and a label vector, and tip, a typical way to set this up mathematically is to say it's a linear function applied to some feature, and that feature should be a function of both the input and the output. Shouldn't bother about that too much right now, because that's not what I'm focusing on. Um, if you can compute your score, that scores responses y to an input x. Uh, if, you, if you compute that as a, as a sum over pairs, for example, of units here, in which case you implicitly make a pairwise a chain assumption on your labels, then it turns out everything is fine and training will work and so on. Because then it turns out you can use dynamic programming. Why is that? So imagine your score decomposes into this sum of pairwise scores. Um, here's the likelihood that right? you want to optimize for training. It's going to be uh, this stuff here for training cases, so a linear term minus the log of the sum of the x of this stuff here. And so nicely here you have only your pairs, so you can actually evaluate this L, this likelihood, for long vectors y, despite the combinatorial explosion, because you only have these pair guys here. It doesn't seem obvious for this part of the term, because you have the sum over all y still here, but it turns out this sum of our y is, of course, a sum, an iterated sum over many components of y of an x. And this x here only affects pairs. Um, but it's an x of a sum of pairs. What is an x of a sum? It's a product of x. So you're going to have a sum <coughs> here of a product of exponential functions applied to pairs. Right? Everyone is still following? Uh, so uh, let's tease this apart, right? So now we have an iterated sum over all the components in Y of a product of all these pairs, pair units here. And so what can we do now? Well, you can use the distributive law and push, say, the last guy, the YT, all the way to the, through the product to the last T where it actually operates, right? This YT, the state of the last label vector, is not going to depend on Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. 
and so we can push the sum through till the end and then we can push the next sum all the way almost to the end and so on and so we can kind of push sums using distributive law and suddenly it turns out you can compute this quantity even though it's a sum over exponentially many things here. So this is what I did here. Right? I took the last one in the sum, just pushed it till here, and now you have a whole other, other bunch of exps that you can also treat that way. So, okay. And it turns out extensions to non-sequences, like images, where you don't have a sequence but a grid, for example, are fairly straightforward, even though this pushing something might not work perfectly there. And then you have to come up with other tricks, which are known as variation uh, inference and so on. Um, but the key point is, and that's the last thing I want to say before the break, that all of this still works if you're not when you're not dealing with a linear score, but a neural network score. That is, if your score here is a sum of pairs again, as an example, neural nets that compute the scores, rather than W transpose score function, feature function, um, and you write down the likelihood that the same decoupling happens. No nothing really changes, and you get a sum of terms, each of which can be uh, is amenable to background, basically. So you have a whole bunch of terms at the end that you run in your dynamic program, and every time you have to evaluate something in the dynamic program and collect derivatives, for example, you can backpropagate through your graph and get the information, and then you can go in. Um, so that means that doing dynamic programming on your label vector up here doesn't get in the way of backprop doing its business up and down, basically. They don't get in each other's way. They, they are kind of independent ideas, and they operate independently on this graph that does the computation. And so structure prediction is just fine with a, with a uh, neural net. Right? There's no problem there. And so what's kind of ironic is that people rediscovered this way after that, and called that like nonlinear conditional random fields and stuff, uh, ignoring the fact, of course, that this has been around way before conditional random fields. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, finish the first half, and um, we'll have a break. <laughs> ...program that runs on the top. So, and that's how you would draw it if you make a little diagram. But you would draw like arrows going this way on your y vector, and arrows going that way in your, to implement your backdrop. And that's how you can kind of remember uh, why these things don't get in each other's way, into each other's way. Um, so I didn't go into detail about this, uh, that the gradient uh, decouples as does the log likelihood, but uh, you can kind of see how this is going to happen. If you do the math, you will see that this is the case. And that's what they discovered back then, and uh, um, that's being put to some use. But uh, just as a matter of caution, I do want to point out that there is a lot of other research going on. So actually, one notable thing, let me just jump back real quick to this particular example here. They, uh, our, this task, obviously, right, predicting depth maps and these kind of things is also about predicting pixels. So you get a whole array of values you want to predict, and obviously you want to take neighboring decisions into consideration, right? If you say this pixel is at this depth, and this at that depth, then if you make independent decisions, you might get a problem. But curiously, that's what they do, and they're doing just fine. So they have very nice results, and it just works. And so uh, part of the reason for why this works, despite not having any kind of structured prediction idea in there, is um, according to the author's opinion or assumption that they do this multi-scale thing here, right? So that they actually have a network that does the job at a very low resolution version of the image and then iteratively refines that over multiple stages. Um, so where all this is going, this whole structured prediction side of things is not clear. And maybe even, even bigger uh, reason for concern as a research agenda to kind of delve into this as a research task is that recurrent nets are really taking off now. And if you have a, if you imagine having a recurrent net, let's go back to maybe this graph here, a recurrent net uh, jumping around 
uh, doing some job here on a sequence and maybe visiting sites, like doing something here, like, make some, like uh, uh, express some opinion here, then jump over here, then jump back and kind of slowly fill in this vector using values. That would be very nicely able to encode, uh, to encode uh, structure knowledge, right? The fact that things should be correlated or whatever structure you want to impose here. But it would be in no way related to the structure prediction setup where you have uh, dynamic programming or something like that. Uh, so there might be other solutions beyond this structure prediction idea out there which we are going to discover and then maybe all of this structure backprop stuff is just going to go away. But that can be maybe a long time in the future, so nobody knows. Um, to give you just one example of a structure prediction neural net, uh, actually a pretty bad example for the purpose of introducing structure prediction because this graph that's output in this particular piece of work isn't very interesting and it's not really a dynamic program or something, but I still want to give this as an example because uh, I think this is just a very nice piece of work and, uh, and it, it is outputting, given an image, it's outputting a graph and so it sort of falls into this framework. So what is this? Um, this is a paper from some guys at Google, uh, Ian Goodfellow, who uh, did an internship there. This is his internship work, basically, uh, last year or two years ago. The task is, given a street view image, which has uh, house numbers like this, uh, output the house number. Right? Input image, output house number. That's it. So why can't you just use an ImageNet style classifier for this? Any ideas? Why this might be a bad idea to do? That's right. For, for example, house numbers can get very large, and uh, actually there are places in the world where they get incredibly large. And so if you want to do it that naive way, you will need something like hundreds of thousands of classes just by default already. And uh, that's tricky, of course. And then the other thing is, of course, there's a lot of structure in here, right? So just in terms of performance, maybe it seems weird to not cash in on the fact that all these different house numbers are actually very, very simple, and there is a very simple task to resolve this problem, which is just find the digits and then classify the digits, each of which fall into one of ten classes, which is very easy. So it would be crazy not to use that fact somehow. And so what they do, uh, they let the network output a graph that has a node which says, first of all, what does the network think is the number of digits it sees in the image? So that would be three, yeah? And then they have another piece of graph that conditioned on that number of digits just gives you the, the values for those digits, and that's it. And as I pointed out, you can just train this up as backdrop, right? So it's, uh, no. There's nothing magical or so going on there. But there is something magical going on in the training, as it seems, because this turns out to work extremely well. And it, uh, I don't know, it was able to beat the, all those baselines and all those hand-engineered systems that people have been using before. This is notably a very important task for a company like Google, right? This is a really applied problem, and solving it can t so, uh, save you tons of money and so on. Um, and so the confident was able to solve it. And that, what's interesting about that is because that strongly suggests that the confident is not just able to uh, replace those engineers that come up with Gabor features and combine them and do sparse coding and stuff, but it goes way beyond that. Right? This is a way harder task in some sense than doing object classification. Because what you have to do in order to find the digits, first of all, you're going to have to find regions where there could be a digit and then uh, you're going to have to, in other words, segment the image in some way. And then, given that segmentation, you might want to do some cleanup because maybe sometimes you see things that are, look like an image, but when you look, the neighbor, look at the neighbor, you figure out that that neighbor isn't actually another digit, but it's still a piece of the first digit and stuff like that. So it's a very <coughs> tricky segmentation problem. And the way humans solve this is by doing over-segmentation, uh, like they, they, they don't segment just across digits, but they segment into kind of smaller pieces, and then they have hidden Markov models which try to clean that up and do all kinds of stuff. So it's a really messy, really ugly kind of pipeline work that you have to do in order to solve it. And so now you just use a confident and just will just do all of that. You know, mm -hmm. just forget about any of this engineering stuff. 
And so that's surpri that was actually very surprising to everyone um, because the confident figures out to do really messy engineering under the hood. And it just learns it, and that's it. Um, was really surprising and I think it's very exciting because uh, the classes are really, really varied and the task is really an engineering problem. It's not just a feature extraction problem anymore if you want. It's, uh, it's a messy thing and the content just learns it out of the box. Uh, there has been some recent work by Jana Beck and others uh, doing something similar uh, in order to find text images. And stuff. So I think this is just uh, the start of a very big agenda again, like uh, where there are going to be hundreds of papers potentially uh, detecting all kinds of things in images and stuff. Um, a long-term goal of all this um, structure prediction for vision has always been scene understanding. So the ability to take an image as input and tell you in a detailed manner what does every pixel belong to, like which object does it belong to or which object class which also is like recognition going beyond just a classification problem. So you want to be able eventually to, be, uh, to say something like, uh, over here is a chair or there's a table, and then this pixel over there belongs to a table, and that one doesn't, and so on. And of course, that ability would be necessary, or might, might not be necessary, would be sufficient in order to be able to navigate the world, to walk around and stuff, and um, not <coughs> bump into things and so on. And uh, especially in automotive, this is also, of course, of great interest because for autonomous cars, you're going to have to be able to distinguish which pixel is piece of a pedestrian and which pixel belongs to a street, a street and stuff like that. Um, this might be an area, uh, I'm not sure, but it might be an area where unsupervised learning has actually a chance to make a dent because you can imagine replacing your graph structure that you impose, your sequence here, by something like a restricted Boltzmann machine maybe, or an autoencoder, and then let that set of hidden units or whatever figure out what the graphical structure should be, you know, what the correlation pattern is among these units here. Um, and there's some work in that direction, but none of this is clear. So no one really knows who's going to win this challenge, right? Is it unsupervised learning? Is it imposing structure? Is it, in other words, structured backdrop? Or is it just going to be a recurrent net operating on these outputs that will just do it? And so if I had to bet, I would bet on the last, but there are a lot of people who bet on other things. Any questions? <coughs> then I'm going to switch topics and talk a little bit, really just a little bit, about recurrent nets. Recurrent nets were treated quite deeply by um, the others, uh, especially in NLP. Um, they play, uh, had always played an important role. Um, they're slowly making their way into vision. Um, mainly because of attention mechanisms, but that is very much an open research agenda. There hasn't been any extremely cool, exciting work of sorts of uh, ImageNet challenge and stuff like that uh, yet in that area. But, um, but I, I personally, I believe it's important. And as I said, I think a lot of things are just going to go away thanks to recurrent nets, eventually. <coughs> So what is a recurrent net? Just to remind everyone, uh, it's a network where you do not just have connections that go forward, but you have connections that form cycles at the end of the day. So the simplest one would be a neuron connected to itself. And as soon as you have a cycle, either a neuron to itself or a neuron to other neurons, and then the neuron feeding back or whatever. So as soon as you have a cycle like this, this thing doesn't make sense anymore, because if you think about what the, tr the computation in this graph is supposed to do, you hit the case where a neuron depends on some other state of itself in some way. So there's, it's not clear how to resolve that problem, right? And so in this is just another way of saying, if you have recurrent connections, that thing there that you're dealing with is a, is a dynamical system, and those classical ideas don't apply anymore. It's not just a simple computational graph that you can evaluate. 
So what do you do? Uh, do you know about that because people have talked about this. You step it for a bunch of steps. So you, uh, first of all, you discretize time, and then you just say, let's step the network for 10 steps, for example. And as soon as you do that, that hidden unit, which has a connection to itself, isn't just a single hidden unit anymore. It's 10 hidden units now, because you step the network. And magically, those arrows leading in cycles disappear, because that hidden unit is connected to itself, but that doesn't mean that it's connected to itself anymore. Now it's connected to its next time step representation of itself, right? So that's a feedforward connection, and that will happen to all of those cycles. So cycles are suddenly gone if you step that network for a fixed number of steps. And that's nice, because if cycles are gone, what you're dealing with is a feedforward network, right? So you can think of it just as a simple feedforward network um, at the end of the day. With some funny weight sharing, though, because if you had a self-connection, that means you have a connection of that hidden at time t to that hidden at time t plus 1. But then the same connection is going to be between the hidden at time t plus 1 and the hidden at time t plus t 2, and so on. So you have weight sharing across layers as a, as a result of this idea. So yet another example of weight sharing, basically. And practically, I mentioned that weight sharing is very <coughs> easy to deal with as a concept if you're using uh, packages like Torch or Theano. And um, when you implement a recurrent net in Theano, it's almost as trivial as implementing a feedforward net. One way of doing that, for example, is to just take a network and do your stepping in a for loop. And just in that for loop, you're going to have a hidden state. And you'll just say, this is a function of the same hidden state previously. And now you just iterated a for loop 10 times. And that way, you build your 10-step graph. And since you can automate things like backprop, you won't even notice a difference in the, in the end in terms of training and so on, because you're just going to call your derivative function. It's going to compute derivatives. It's going to take care of the fact that there was sharing across those time slices. So you won't notice. And you can just train this thing, and it's just going to work. But uh, being a recurrent net, it has, of course, a couple of subtleties that will pop up. None of which is related to this weight sharing and stuff, but uh, typically you s there are other things. Like typically you step for more than 10 steps. You have like <coughs> RNNs that go over like 100 or a couple of hundred steps. So that means you will have a deep network that is very, very deep in the end. And so you're going to backprop through many, many layers as a result. That's one of the problems. Another potential problem is that because of the weight sharing, uh, the backprop is going to amount to computing derivatives by matrix multiplication. Uh, using the same matrix again and again, right? Because it's always the same matrix. You might apply a matrix M by a matrix M by a matrix M by a matrix M over and over again. And then depending on the eigenvalues of that matrix, funny things can happen. And, uh, <coughs> values can blow up or decay to zero and stuff like that. More easily, it seems, than in deep networks, which are not written. But because of this vanishing gradient, that's also called vanishing gradient problem. I think uh, people are aware of this, right? Is, has this been treated to some degree previously here? This vanishing gradient issue? OK. Um, because of that, LSTMs were introduced a long, long time ago in, uh, to deal with this exact issue. And the idea of the LSTM, just to repeat that, is very simple. It just means. Multiplying matrices with bad eigenvalues is bad, so let's not do that. Let's multiply by the identity matrix. Let's have hidden units connected to each other, like this stack of hidden units connected to the next step, step using the identity matrix. Uh, multiplying many identity matrices to, together doesn't hurt. You, know? you can do that a billion times. It's not going to cause a problem. Um, but of course, in itself, that's a completely useless operation because um, identity transformations don't do anything. Uh, so you might as well not have this deep layered thing. Um, but you can make it useful. And that's the idea of LSTM, right? You can put gating connections around this useless block that you have, a useless set of hidden units in your network. And um, those gating connections can be used in various different ways. For example, you can have a gate that says whenever this gate is open, so this is just another hidden unit, um, you're going to write things into uh, the state of those stable hiddens. And you can have another gate that reads out, and, you, and there are various other variations of gates that people throw in there or get rid of. And it doesn't really matter what you do. As soon as you have hiddens that cannot blow up, or whose derivative computations do not blow up, 
thanks to identity matrix, plus some gates around them, you're basically fine. Then, then uh, you have something that can be stable across time, and it's still useful in terms of uh, doing useful computation. It's a, also a big research agenda, how to exactly set this up optimally so that it's, it can be fast and stuff. And people have been exploring variations of this idea for quite a bit, but it's still a very, very big open question. So far, it seems pretty clear that you need multiplicative corrections, otherwise you will not successfully train our hands, but that's sort of all that we know. Um, so I mentioned there are a couple of applications. Caption generation is the obvious one, because uh, NLP is an obvious consumer for recurrent network technology, and so turning an image into caption has an NLP site, which is uh, generating the text, the textual description, and so that can naturally be an RNN. And so there you go. So now you have an RNN that you can apply to something that's vision related. An obvious way of putting RNNs into vision. I'm sneaking it in via NLP, kind of. Uh, so actually, there's one interesting thing about this uh, caption generation stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you are aware of this paper, but there is, has been some observations that um, so nearest neighbor methods just perform fairly well in this task. So this task seems extremely surprising. It's so surprising that the media jumped onto it and stuff like that, right? So you can turn an image into a text that describes it. It seems magic, right? It seems like the, the network really understands up to some funny cases that Russ talked about yesterday and so on, but it basically understands something about the visual world um, and can describe it and stuff. But all of this is pretty much all a hallucination because this already works pretty damn well if you just pick the training caption the right way. So if you just use something like nearest, some elaborate nearest neighbor scheme to find a good caption among the training captions to describe any given new image, you're already doing something that seems very amazing. Uh, and then the, what RNNs add on top of that is kind of making that a little bit better. The amazing part already happens with, with nearest neighbor methods. And so um, humans tend to interpret a lot, uh, and to put a lot into this, uh, the caption that they see. Right? They, they overinterpret it in terms of understanding, but it's much less than that. Right? Even nearest neighbor methods on those 80,000 training captions are already pretty good. So there's not much of visual understanding there yet. Um, and then there's visual attention, which is a bigger scheme and a more important aspect of RNNs and vision. So they might as well one day replace convolutional networks because they get rid of a lot of uh, computation and a lot of messy shoveling around of pixels uh, into call operations and all kinds of messy stuff that confidence do implicitly by doing this convolution idea. Um, so uh, people talked about that before, so I'm not going to dwell on this much either, except for mentioning that there are currently two streams of research. One is soft attention and the other is hard attention. Soft attention is very easy and you can backpropagate for learning um, because it just amounts to using a weighted sum of pixels with weights that are implicitly computed by the network as it goes through time. Um, in order to kind of condense the image into something smaller and then having another part of the network operate on this smaller thing in order to speed up computation. So um, soft attention was pretty much explored and introduced pretty much the first time seriously, pretty recently in a paper called something like Draw. Uh, I don't know exactly the title. Um, deep mind. Uh, I think I'm going to go back to that briefly in a second. Um, the idea is you define some kind of region, uh, there are many ways of doing that, so they decided to decompose a region into little uh, points where on which they put a Gaussian and then a weighted sum using those Gaussian functions as weights of these values, pixel values here, is going to compute a new value and so at the end of the day it amounts to, if those Gaussians decay fast enough, getting rid of some area of the image and kind of zooming in into a little part of the image. and um, there are some parameters in there that you can choose, like the, the, the width of all these Gaussians and the distance of the Gaussians to one another and all kind of stuff. They just tried this out and it seemed to work well, but it's probably not the last 
paper in this direction. Um, so it just means that a big image gets put into, a, transformed into something small, and then it's on that smaller image, you can have now another piece of network doing some kind of operations more easily. And since this is just a smooth, right, a weighted sum of everything in the end, of all pixels, that gets shoveled into the rest of the network, backprop will work, because you're going to go through this thing, backpropagate uh, through those Gaussians, and then further into the decision maker that will define those weighting functions for you. And so you have a big graph at the end, and you can just use backprop to train that whole graph. That has to be contrasted with what people now call hard attention, where you do not use a weighted, soft weighted sum of everything, but rather crop a piece of the image in a hard way. So you really just cut out a piece of the image. So it's so, uh, that something similar would happen if you have a Gaussian that doesn't decay, that decays too fast, kind of, that doesn't kind of cover everything. Because if derivatives are zero in an image, and so for hard attention this is the case, because cropping is like multiplying by a square window, kind of. So if you set values exactly to zero, derivatives won't flow anymore, and you cannot backprop through that image back into your decision maker of where to put the window in order to learn where you should have put the window. And so backprop doesn't work in that case. Uh, that is to say, it does work for the rest of the network, but it doesn't, you, there are places in the network through which you cannot backpropagate, and you can have to come up with tricks. And the tricks, uh, what Rust talked about yesterday, uh, are often related to probabilistic models. You can try to sample those positions where you're going to look and then try to make learning work nevertheless. But of course, as a result of not having just backprop as an end-to-end -end system, this is going to be much slower and messier and so on. And so there are people doing both. Right? So people are playing with soft and with hard attention. And um, who knows what will be more useful in the end. <coughs> By comparison to confidence, attention is very powerful just because we don't do this very big set of computations all the time. And what's also interesting about attention, one last thing to mention, is that humans do it, of course. You use saccades. So you, you don't have a confnet because you don't have weight sharing in the brain. And that doesn't seem to be an obvious way to make use of translation invariants and images. You don't use weight sharing. And so what do you do instead? You just look around um, in order to do something like weight sharing. You use the same piece of neural hardware, your fovea, the little high resolution center of your field of view, and displace it. You know, look here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and uh, that's sort of like simulating something like weight sharing for you. Um, and that works pretty well for humans, as everyone knows. And uh, so why, why not simulate that? And so the nice thing about backprop through time is that we can learn an optimal policy of where to look, when and where to look, in order to solve whichever task, just as training an ImageNet, ConfNet, uh, to for classification. And so that's very nice for video, because videos are such a massive amount of data that you might not want to just feed every frame into a convolutional network. You, you want to maybe ignore things. And in a video, imagine uh, you have an attention mechanism on video. If your attention mechanism gets informed by the fact that an object is moving over here and has learned to operate on this particular frame rate and so on, it will be able to anticipate that if it has to figure something out about this particular object, it might have to jump ahead for a few pixels anticipate where this object is going to land, and then it's going to be able to analyze it, and all these kind of things. And none of this is stuff that you have to engineer. All of this will just emerge out of the system by using backprop. So that's why I think attention is going to be here for a long time. It's going to solve a lot of important problems. But we're not quite there yet, so we're talking about two, a whole bunch of 2015 papers, basically, here. So it's just getting started. Well, there's one 2013, but it's all very recent. Uh, I just mentioned draw as an application of soft attention. That's kind of probably the only well-known, at least, attention paper out there right now, which applies attention to some actual task. The task being, curiously, in this case, just rendering images. Uh, so they showed that if you use this attention mechanism um, and train it in a recurrent net uh, such that you generate an image after your 10 steps. Um, 
then this does a pretty good job, right? So here you see, for example, a sequence of images as they evolve. So what the model does is it, it applies its operations on a canvas. That's actually a crucial insight, a crucial idea of, for, uh, in order to make this work. The network has at its disposal, if you want, a canvas on which it can draw. That's why they call this network draw, basically. Um, and so at every time step, the network can decide to put some ink somewhere in the image, and it can continue doing so for, for a while, for like 10 steps or so. And uh, in the end, it will have drawn something for you. And now you can measure the squared error or whatever you want between what the network has drawn and some actual image and backpropagate through this network so that it will generate stuff that you actually care about. Um, there are some tricky parts to this, which, which is, um, it doesn't really matter what the network draws. If you just want to have it draw natural images, or digits in this case, and digits, you're going to have to figure out how to train this thing. Uh, because you don't want to penalize it for drawing the wrong digit or something, right? You just want to see whether it grew, looks in any way like any digit in your training data. And there are kind of two schemes that people are exploring for making this kind of generation network work. One is called adversarial training, where you say you have a separate system which was previously or uh, concurrently trained to distinguish between digits and other stuff. And that thing is going to judge whether you generated a digit or not. And that thing can be trained using actual training data. And then you have your actual generation network, which tries to draw stuff for you, um, which can then be evaluated using this general effect. Yeah. So, uh, this, sorry, this discriminator network. Um, that's not how these guys trained this setup, but it would probably be applicable to this. What these guys did was uh, actually make use of auto encoders. So they add an extra encoder step at every time step, which sees the image that it's supposed to generate. And so as part of this whole process, it will always have an encoding of an actual image that gets put into this recurrent net at every point in time. And after they're done training, they get rid of the encoder part, they just throw that out and sample those hidden states that the autoencoder would have computed <coughs> and uh, randomly. And so then they have something like a simulation of the encoder process, which gives them the random numbers and they can be fed into the decoder part of the network, which does the actual drawing, and that turns out to work well. Um, they made use of a framework called variation of autoencoders, because then you can use the sampling and stuff, but I won't get into this here. Getting too much into detail. Um, the nice thing is this works very well and it's probably about as good as it gets in terms of rendering, rendering, sorry, rendering natural images or not natural images, like uh, street numbers, for example. So you can run this on the street number data set and then you can ask the network to draw street numbers for you uh, and then it will just do that. And those street numbers are usually things that the network hasn't seen in the training set. So here, the last row that you see here, uh, next to it, you see the nearest training set in terms of Euclidean distance, just to show that this is not just copying a training example uh, as a solution. And this was very exciting. It's uh, something like three, four months old, I think, this work. And uh, it's very exciting because this has been a sport kind of in the neuroscience and machine learning community for a long time, rendering images. Um, because you can argue, if you can render images, then you must know something about images. And, and so that's kind of a proof that the network is smart in some way. And people have failed at it desperately. It's nothing worked in, in any way at all for a long time. And now suddenly it works. And, uh, probably that's mainly because of the use of recurrent nets. Because it seems like a good idea to draw things not instantaneously by having a system output an image in one shot, kind of, but having a network operate on a canvas so that it can slowly evolve what it's supposed to generate for you. In fact, that's how humans would generate an image. You, know? you would just take a pen and just start going and looking at what you have done so far and maybe revise what you did and so on. But you need a recurrent net for that. And, um, that's also another reason why recurrent nets are getting so powerful and interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there a potential for Absolutely, yes. Uh, is there a potential for uh, this in, in an image enhancement context or something like that? I think there's a potential in this 
even lower than that in just uh, in painting, for example, eh? which is also a task that's very big in computer vision. Right? There are also many, many papers on in painting. Um, it's an obvious thing to take this network and just try to do in painting with it. My, I have a hunch that it's gonna maybe throw out the in painting literature of the last 20 years and it's just gonna do a better job at it. I wouldn't be surprised, um, but I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it deeply. I'm not sure what kind of training data you would need and if it's available and, and so on. But if you could, or if you could maybe train this on natural images and then use that in some way and combine it with your training, I don't know. But I'm sure people are gonna be working on an application of this in, in painting, and but you mentioned image enhancement, which is kind of a broader scheme, which is just, given an image, can you give me a prettier image? Can you kind of mess with the image, make it look better or something? Uh, clean it up, denoise maybe. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So that could be, uh, super resolution would be imaginable, right? You could, instead of conditioning at every time step on the actual image, you could condition on a low resolution version of the image. And the job of the, the draw network would then be just to render the image in higher resolution, period. And, and, right, and, right, right, right. And there's a lot of work on super resolution, and it seems natural to apply these kind of ideas in this field, definitely. Given how extremely well they work by comparison to anything that anyone has ever done before, uh, it seems highly likely that they are going to be able to do a good job on image enhancement tasks. Something in the same direction, which is not exactly enhancement, but uh, stylistic rendering, might think of this as a kind of enhancement maybe, has been done very recently. And it's actually very interestingly related to draw even though it hasn't been conceived as that. Uh, it's essentially a recurrent net in the end, if you think about it. But so here's what the, the authors do. It's Matthias Bethke from, uh, from uh, Tübingen and uh, some of his colleagues. Uh, that paper was put on archive, I think, three weeks ago maybe, or one month ago, something like that. Um, who here has seen that paper? I'm just curious. No one, okay. Then it's definitely worth bringing this up here. It's a beautiful, simple idea and it just works and it just gives amazing results um, for a task that maybe uh, you might not consider interesting but I think it's a pretty interesting thing so you take a photo of whatever and you take a, a, a painting and the goal is to render this photo in the style of this painting basically. that's what they want to do that's the task they want to solve and here you see some examples of this in action, right? So given this photo and this painting, you get a rendering in this style. If you take like Van Gogh or something, you get a rendering in a different style. And, and, uh, and you see that the, the, the solution kind of adapts aspects of the uh, original image and ports it to the target scene, rendering the target scene in that particular style. We should zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. This photo and then rendered in various times. Um, so how did they do that? It's very, very simple. That makes it so nice. Um, <coughs> if you have a confnet that's pre-trained on ImageNet, that's a very, very good model of the visual world, which is why, as I said, you should reuse it for any vision task. And you should also reuse it if you want to do drawing or painting or something like that. And so how are they using that? They're using it by taking the activations at some layer in the network for a given image. So you can record those activations here. And then they compute derivatives of the activations with respect to pixels, which is trivial to do in those packages, right? Instead of computing derivatives using backprop with respect to parameters, you can compute derivatives with respect to pixels. No one can stop you from that. And then they ask an input image, so they feed in an input image x, and they do gradient descent on X so as to match the activations at this layer for some given target image. 
If you do just that, so you just uh, ask the input X to replicate the activations at, say, the sixth layer in the network, what you will see, if you try this, is uh, an image just like that. Right? So if you just want to match activations, the best thing you can do is have an image which just looks like the original image. And so that turns out to work pretty well. And depending on how high you go in the network, you get maybe slightly more abstract renderings of this. But it pretty much works. You can easily replicate an image by asking it to replicate the activities using squared error, for example, at some higher layer. Or maybe multiple layers. But now you also want to have the style. And so what they do for style is they take the style image, compute the activations at that same layer, and then they define a function on the style uh, representation. And what the function that they chose, that they suggested, is taking all pairwise products between the values and your feature maps in your component. That's a pretty messy thing, and it's a pretty big object, because you're going to have product of everything with everything, basically. So you build what they call a gram matrix, which is sort, it's sort of kind of like a gram matrix. And what you want to do in order to replicate the style of another image is, of course, this gram matrix stuff here is differentiable. So you can look, do gradient descent in the input space to match the gramian of this representation up here, right? all the pairwise products of the representation up there. And they use squared error on that or something. So they just want to make the gramian of the target image X be similar to the gramian of the style image. And so now they have two cost terms. One, to replicate the image, the content itself, and the other, to replicate the gramian of some other image, which they call style. So you add these costs together using some weighting, and you just do gradient descent. And then this is what you get as a result. Right? So then you get a rendering of the image in a different style. Um, this opens up a whole another area of potential investigation because you could imagine using other kinds of functions for your style or other functions that compute other things than style, right? Certain other aspects of the image. So maybe you want to mess with this image in another way, not by rendering it in an artistic way, but maybe by putting some objects in there in some sensible way or doing whatever you want to do. Um, what's interesting about this is in terms of uh, draw is that it defines a recurrence. So if you want to do gradient descent in the input image, what you do is you'll have a CNN, you put in the input image, you get your activations, then you, use, then you compare those with the target image using spread error, and then you back propagate, and now you get a delta x, an update on the x thanks to those derivatives. And that you're going to apply to the original image. <coughs> but what does that mean? You start with an original image, say random, you do your computation, you get a delta x, and you add this delta x into the new image. Well, you can just think of this x in that case as a canvas onto which you accumulate information, right? So it's very much like draw in that sense. You have a canvas on which you draw slowly in order to generate a target rendering. Um, and it's also recurrence because it's a recurrent net. Uh, in the, I mean, it's not a recurrent net, but it's a recurrent computation because you want to do that in multiple steps. Because gradient descent needs multiple steps to operate. Right? You're not going to do one delta, but you're going to run until you converge. There's a difference, which is draw typically takes something like ten steps, and it has this whole autoencoder kind of mechanism built in. Whereas this takes more steps, usually like a hundred or something, if depending on, on learning on learning rate and stuff like that, um, and a more important difference, though, is that this doesn't learn the parameters of the network, but it replicates a given image using a recurrence by, use, by making use of a pre-trained network in order to define what a good visual image is, rather than uh, trying to learn the parameters. And I think this just means for people working with draw that they should just put in a continent as well. There's no reason to have uh, uh, recurrent net relearn everything about the visual world and if, as I said before, a network that ha knows everything you want to know about the visual world is lying around on the internet and you can just use it. And we know already that it took a week or so to, or two weeks to, to train that other network. So how would you ever expect your own network that has to do all this additional stuff to be faster than that, right? So from that you can kind of extrapolate and assume what you're going to need is something like three months of training, because you want to do even fancier stuff, like drawing images. And so why even do that, given that that other thing is already there? So that feeds back into my argument in the beginning, that there's going to be much more sharing of networks, which is uh, called separation of concerns. Right? Let's 
people who are experts on training confidence do their stuff and get better, whereas other people are training uh, other pieces uh, to solve other kinds of tasks. But we share those pieces of network in order to get better. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, so one final comment about the attention idea, and uh, it actually is also related to draw. That's that slowly we're moving beyond the idea of a simple feedforward computation to something more elaborate. And I think you can drive this whole agenda much further. And this is actually what has happened and is still happening in the NLP community mainly right now. And this is just an outlook, kind of. I believe the same thing will happen in the vision community. So this whole transition will occur there. And I sort of mentioned that, but uh, so here's a more concrete view of this. Uh, when you have an RNN and you have an attention kind of mechanism, you can push that idea much further and let that attention not only operate on pixels in your visual field, but you can let the attention operate on anywhere in your memory, anywhere, in any, any cells that you have available. And so that means you can write things in memory if you want, which is sort of what an LSDM already does to some degree, and have some mechanism read things out later on if you need it, or operate on that things, those things and so on. And um, so you can imagine a kind of computation which is much more like a classical computer. So you have some workspace, some memory, you can write into it, you have an attention mechanism, which is basically just another way of addressing. Uh, it's an addressing mechanism, right? that's what attention is. It says, where should I look, where should I focus? It's like random access, basically. Um, and so there has been some work in the NLP community of trying this out, right? Though there are papers like neural tuning machine, memory networks, learning to transmit with unbounded memory, and so on. Uh, here's a picture of one of such things where they use an RNN to simulate something like a stack. So they take a very classic computer science concept, a stack onto which you can push and from which you can pull. And if you redefine those pushing and pulling operations using a smooth kind of definition where you don't push completely, but in a way that's some kind of idea. So you push only to some degree. So you override values to some degree and then pull in the same way. Then that whole thing is again differentiable. And so why not have a stack of all things in your big network? Because we know that stacks are useful. And so maybe now the network will use that stack to remember stuff for a while and so on. And so there's a lot of work in that area right now. And there are cases where this actually seems to help and improve our models that do not make use of this idea. Um, but much more work has to be done, of course, to kind of see how far we can push this agenda. Uh, one, just to give you a flavor of the NLP side of things where people are doing this, um, here's a paper from MetaMind company uh, where they um, look at tasks like this one, where you're given a text and then you're given a question and then you're supposed to output an answer. <coughs> or oh, this one here, another text, another question, another answer. Maybe another question completely unrelated with another answer and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to have a network that solves these kinds of tasks, you should probably do it in a way that humans would do it. Right? If a human gets this question, there's no way you're going to answer this problem, at least if the test text is a little bit larger, by doing other than going back into the text and reading it again maybe and kind of jumping back and forth and uh, trying to search for the answer and kind of operating on this thing. Right? Many natural tasks are not a black box thing where you just output the answer. You would kind of do things to the data until you have an answer. And so that's what they do. So they build a network which has many, several components to it. It has a recurrent net which just goes over the text. Then it has a memory box where the network can write things and out of which it can read things. Mm -hmm. And they allow the network to go over the text and the memory, the, the, what they call episodic memory many times, so the, or up to three times maybe or something. So the network can read a little bit of text and decide to maybe jump back to understand it better, whatever, you know, and then write some notes on its memory and then maybe go back again and read the, read the question again and so on. And until it feels comfortable about the answer and then it can answer in, in text to give you the answer. So there's another RNN which just always an 
So the idea of putting in a workspace, it's sort of like the draw idea of accumulating an image, but it doesn't only have to be on the data, right? It can also be on memory. It's very, very powerful, I think, because it basically means now what you have here is a little computer. It's like a von Neumann architecture, almost, or something equivalent to that, right? It's a computer that can do stuff, but by having defined all the operations as differentiable operations, in order to program this computer, you use backdrop. That's it. And it already works pretty well. And this is how one could imagine how this is going to go into vision. Even though all there is right now in this direction is this data, kind of. And I don't know any work that is really exploiting this. But I'm sure there are going to be papers that use episodic memory and Turing machine ideas, you know, classic von Neumann hardware, differentiable, <coughs> trained with backdrop in order to solve these kind of tasks. This data set is uh, called Visual Question Answering. It was proposed by Antoll and others very recently. And uh, it looks like this, right? You have images and questions, and the questions go way further than a classifier uh, could ever be able to deal with. So, for example, what color are her eyes, what is the mustache made of, and so on. Uh, so you really need to understand the concepts and, you know, need to know about colors and all kinds of stuff in order to answer those questions. And so the hope is that as we go more and more into this computational paradigm, you know, use deep learning to simulate a computer, that we'll be getting better at these kind of tasks. But right now, uh, this is sort of the state of affairs, right? The data set is coming, and so it, part of it exists, you can download it, but uh, that's about it. Right? It's a starting point to do research. And this is also not a big data set, of course, because uh, you will need a lot, and probably you will need more than this data set in order to solve this task eventually. It's a very interesting way to evaluate what you have. And this is something I, I predict is going to be around for the next few years, and people are going to be playing with this. And it's much more exciting than caption generation, of course. It uh, requires much more of an understanding. And I think nearest neighbor kind of schemes are just not going to work anymore in this case. At least on some of those questions, even though others may not work. <clears throat> so this discussion, uh, I'm going to wrap up uh, with just one comment, which is a uh, kind of an ironic fact in history. In around the 40s or 50s, people re decided that f uh, serial compute hardware is good, and so they rode with it for like 60 years or something. And um, that was the only kind of hardware, pretty much, see, that was seriously built and sold and stuff like that, and made nice and fast and so on. And it's still the case. Kind of. So CPUs and von Neumann rule. And uh, since this was the only hardware that was built, everyone trained their neural nets on these hard those kind of hardware. But as I pointed out in the beginning, neural nets shine when you give them big, dense, parallel computations. That's the thing, and one could argue the only thing that a neural net is good at. It can exploit parallelism for you. Um, and so if you simulate this beautiful parallel exploiting system on a CPU, you shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work very well. And, um, and it didn't, it sort of worked a little bit, but it never really kind of made it, had an impact in any application anymore, like vision and so on. Um, and today, we, now with this current trend of using RNNs to simulate Turing machines and stuff, we're going the exact opposite, right? So now we are simulating classic hardware on neural nets, on a neural network substrate. Kind of. and this, on the other hand, works very well, right? And there's a lot of evidence that this is really the thing we should be doing in deep learning, like simulating classical computer ideas on a neural network. And so why is that? Well, th there's one very simple reason. Neural nets can be made arbitrarily fast by making your parallel computation <coughs> wider. You know? As NVIDIA puts out a bigger GPU so you can do bigger matrix multiplies, you're going to be able to use a bigger network that is it's more powerful and works better at no additional computational cost. And that scales as long as you can make your computations wider. And for hardware people, this is a complete game changer, and that makes a lot of the, the whole hardware industry kind of extremely excited right 
because it was getting harder and harder and harder to scale up the, the efficiency of uh, CPU machinery because uh, where we are now, all you're basically doing on a little chip is shoveling around data and dealing with logic of all kinds of sort in order to uh, get computations done. So you basically never do a computation. You only like, shovel around bits until you are kind of in the right register and whatnot with caching and all kinds of stuff and until you actually do a computation. And so logic is kind of overtaking everything. And then there are things like the, the end of Moore's law and people are concerned that we cannot further scale things up and so on. And now comes along a kind of operation that says we can use really simple and primitive hardware, just very wide, dense parallelism, and there's actually a way to exploit that. And so for hardware companies, that means there is something they can be doing which is not suffering from Moore's law, which is much nicer in, in many ways, uh, and it, it doesn't require a lot of power consumption and stuff like that, um, and it can just be made to work. And so this is one of the reasons why I think the, the Connection between hardware and deep learning is going to be very important as we move forward. Um, okay, so I'm talking about vision here though. So is there any way this is going to apply to vision? I believe yes, um, because of many tasks allowing to evolve a solution rather than just giving you a solution in 10 steps of computation is very natural. Um, Object detection, obviously, this, this attention and stuff like that is an obvious candidate. I talked about structure prediction, so I said maybe this backprop, structure backprop will go away because of that. Um, segmentation is an obvious candidate, and in fact, uh, so you asked about image enhancement. You can also think of segmentation as an image enhancement problem, where given an image, you want another image that you'll call mask, that tells you what are the foreground and what are the background principles. And so why on earth would we try to have a system that does that in one path and then does some messy computation using an MRF on top to clean things up after the fact? If you have something like draw, you already know that you can render something like a human would do. Um, segmentation is, has been hot for a long time in computer vision because people assume that it's a prerequisite to object recognition. You know, before you can recognize that uh, there is a sign, uh, you're going to have to segment it and separate it from the rest of the image. And once you've done that, you can cut it out and run another kind of system on it in order to do the recognition. But it turns out this is not actually how vision works. Right? You can recognize that even if it's half occluded and whatever, and it's still going to work. And the reason it's going to work is humans don't recognize things by using segmentation in the loop. You just get statistical cues that will tell you what you're looking at and so on. And it turns out confidence do the same thing, right? So you don't need segmentation as a subtask in recognition at all. Um, and in fact, when humans do segmentation, their databases, right, human segmented images, guess what? Those humans who labeled this data set did that in an iterative process by looking at the image and then clicking pixel for pixel on where the ob they think the object is. This is how humans segment images, right? It's not somewhere deeply in your visual processing pipeline, it's some automatic thing that happens within a few milliseconds. It's a very complicated, elaborate process where you look at the image, make decisions, revise your decisions, and go about your job that way. And so why on earth would we try to train a network to do it in any other way than that? So I think what's going to happen with segmentation next is that people will solve this task using neural nets and the way they do it is they use something like draw off the shelf, train it to do segmentation and that's going to be the end of the story. Um, image synthesis is kind of a broader class of the same problem. Um, and, but you can apply the same idea to much more than that, right? So for example, the way to generate mocap sequences for computer games and stuff, automatically, it's not working very well, so computer gaming companies use more acted motion and stuff like that. It's working somewhat, but it's totally messy, and there's no pretty solution to it. And so now slowly people are embracing this using deep learning ideas by, for example, having a recurrent net that performs a motion, like walking, whatever. Um, but you can even go one step further again, right? If you have a human editor in your computer gaming company that tries to make a motion look better by just moving the limbs in the right place at the right time, and so, why not simulate that human editor instead of the person doing the motion, right? Why not train a neural net that draws, I mean, that kind of operates on the limb positions just like that guy sitting at that computer gaming company 
Why do you have a recurrent net that tries to make the motion in one pass and get it right by the way? So I think there's a huge amount of potential for going beyond simple RNNs and simple feedforward networks towards computational paradigms. And then lastly, as an example, um, where this is also going to have an impact is robotics. And, uh, so there are many computer vision tasks, like segmentation, which maybe are not, should not be considered a proper computer vision task, and maybe we're better off not even bothering and just solving the task that we care about. So uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, paper, I've also from DeepMind from 2013, and done some follow-up work where they train deep, uh, deep learning-inspired ways to do reinforcement learning. And they show that you can play Atari games by just looking at pixels and so on. There's some very, very nice videos where you can watch the networks play well and so on. Um, and now a lot of people are going towards applying those ideas in, uh, in, in robotics. Um, robotics is still a very, very messy engineered field, but it might change things to these kinds of things. So here's a recent paper by Levine and others where they use some of those ideas in order to learn dexterous manipulation tasks and stuff like that. Like all very difficult things to get a robot to do. And actually there are other efforts by others like taking ideas from this computer game, learn on pixels and bring, bringing it into the real world so that robots will actually do something. Um, that's reinforcement learning. Why is it reinforcement learning? It's because you don't have a data set. There isn't such a thing as a data set in this domain. All there is is a world, right? And that's also what we're facing with, of course, right? Children don't have a data set from which they learn, they interact with the world. And if you want to put that into a machine and do learning, you need a simulator of that world or part of that world. And so the data set in this domain is a simulator which tells you if you do this, then the world is going to look like that. If you do this, then it's going to be there and so on. It's simulation in place of data set. Um, and that's what you need in robotics. I mean, you can use data sets to solve subtasks like vision, but in the end, that thing is going to do something. It's going to kind of have a task, and maybe it throws something over, and it's going to fall over, and it's going to have to react to it. You will not know that something will fall over if you move in the wrong way until you run this and see what happens. And so that's why you need a simulator, and that's why you need reinforcement. The disaster, of course, is you're never going to be able to backpropagate through this simulation. And so, um, there is a place where backprop doesn't work. There's a place through which you cannot differentiate. And so you need to use some kind of reinforcement with an idea. But then again, after you move beyond this stage and you sampling like an attention or something to get beyond the stage, that doesn't quite work. The rest of the network might just be a recurrent net that is trying to backprop things. So everything is still more or less fine. Um, so all of this means many vision problems might not be such a problem after all if you look at the big picture and you are aware of what you're actually trying to solve here. So maybe you shouldn't go for the sub-problem, you should just go for the problem that you actually care about. If that's robotics, maybe you don't need a separate vision system, but you embed something in your network just like this. And that something that you embed might as well be a pre-trained conv net that you downloaded off the web. Which solved a separate but probably related vision problem just well enough. Just a very quick summary of basically all I said. Uh, what is going to happen is there are going to be more, more, more applications. Um, architectures are going to change quite a bit, I'm sure, and recurrent nets are going to get more important, and mainly because you have this neural program idea coming up now, um, using classic hardware simulated on a neural substrate. Uh, reinforcement learning, because of the fact that many tasks are not well defined using a data set, it's going to get more and more important. Uh, of course, there's a lot of theory, so there are a lot of problems we're facing, like vanishing rings and so on. And Many things still have to be understood in this problems. Since deep learning is driven by hardware developments, I think, as I said before, the intersection between the and hardware is going to be important. And hardware-friendly networks are going to be useful because they're going to allow us to exploit 
better hardware and scale things up. And scaling up is the name of the game anyway, because currently all the performance curves are like this. You get better, 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 and then you stop because you, and you don't level off. So you get better, 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 level off a little bit, just a little bit. And then you stop, though, because you cannot wait more than a month. This might have been a month of training, and so what are you going to do? Uh, if you had a bigger GPU, you could have looked of how it would develop, and maybe at some point you are right and you would level off, or maybe you wouldn't, or maybe you would level off, as often happens in training, and then you actually get better after another year of waiting or something. Um, so none of this will be visible unless we have faster hardware, and it's by scaling things up. And uh, in terms of vision, I think uh, another big challenge is Combining it, and that goes a lot in the direction of what Russ talked about yesterday. Combining vision and language and speech and robotics and all of this together. Um, it's exciting to see that we can solve this mystery that people call the grounding problem in AI. That words do not have a uh, real world representation associated with them. I think by just combining language models with vision pipelines in the right way, it's just going to allow us to solve this mystery. And so when a machine translation system in two years from now is going to say, I see a, a red elephant, it's actually going to understand by what it means by the word red elephant. You know, it's just going to have a, a concept. Sort of in the, in the back of its head, the, the idea of a red elephant is going to pop up real quick. And it's going to understand what that means because it has another pathway, a visual pathway, that knows what the word red means what the word elephant means, and it's going to have a uh, language pathway that understands what the attachment of an adjective to a noun means, that it's kind of modifying the noun and all these kind of things. And um, so that would just get rid of grounding right there. And for many, grounding is related to consciousness, so it would kind of eliminate the idea of consciousness research and all this kind of philosophical mess uh, related to uh, what consciousness is and so on. Uh, anyway, so that gets very philosophical, so I'm going to stop this first half now, and um, I'm going to give you a two-minute break without standing up, and, uh, so that I can set up something else, and, uh, and then we'll continue. Uh, it is being explored, and there are challenges that are being won and all kinds of stuff, but the big dilemma in medical imaging is that there's not much data available, and that's, that is the problem. Uh, but there are people playing with this, and then there's the idea, of course, again, of using a network trained on other images as a feature extractor and that kind of stuff. And it works very well, and there are some very, very good, nice examples and stuff. And I think the field of medical imaging is transforming, just as all the other fields of vision are transforming, just because of neural nets. As far as I can tell from talking to people and stuff. Um, the data issue is a huge issue, and it has to do with privacy, of course, and, and stuff. Yeah, Hospitals are hesitant to give you data for obvious reasons, and it's, it's kind of also a disaster, because if we had that data and would give up on that privacy, then uh, we would save lives. But it's, it's a tricky issue, and it's like, what are we going to do? Give up on privacy, save lives, or, or not? Or is there a way to anonymize? and so on. It's messy and tricky and hopefully there's going to be some kind of solution. Doctors use their visual pathway in order to analyze images and segment, or even labor, laboratory people and stuff, to segment cell images and stuff. Uh, so there is a potential in utilizing a vanilla general visual system to solve the task, even though those images aren't natural images in that sense. Right? There might be microscopic images and stuff. But it still works, right? So that gives you some hope that uh, this transfer learning idea will happen. Thank you. you talked about this transfer learning when you take yes. some pre-learned neural network and take the uh, one of the last layers, right? Yes. And then if you want to use it, then you just add one layer or you take, add several ones. Yes, so when you uh, just want to have a confident as, an, as a feature extractor, should you, your question is basically, should you, when, once you extracted your features from the penultimate layer, 
and then put it into a new classifier. Should that new classifier just be a linear classifier or should it maybe be a, itself a neural net or something, right? That's sort of the question, which is, I don't have an answer. It depends probably on many factors. If there is quite a bit of other data available, then you might be able to afford training a neural net. Otherwise, maybe you should just use a linear classifier or probably a heavily regularized linear classifier even. But um, this is a pretty recent thing, right? This has been done for the last like one to two years only, this, this generic feature extraction idea derived from a continent or some other network maybe at some point. Um, and it hasn't been explored at all. So I said the last layer, but you can of course also take some lower layers and maybe concatenate them or do some other thing. Um, and then rather than just using it as a feature extractor, if you have really enough data, you might just want to initialize a confnet as a large <coughs> recognizer and then train that whole network on the little bit of extra data that you have. Or even add the objectives to train your network on your proper task, but regularize it by adding a cost term that makes this network also perform well on ImageNet or whatever you, you can imagine. Right? There are many, many variations of this. Um, and it's yeah, it's pretty robust in any case. If you don't take the last layer, but the one before, it's probably also going to work for you. And, so on, right? and there are some studies of how much this degrades as you go through this la layers and stuff. But this is not clear exactly what you should do. Um, but it's robust, so there's, no, there's a solution. It's just what is the best possible thing that's not clear. Um, and then maybe I should comment also that uh, the same thing happens in other domains. So for example, if you train a machine translation network, the, the word embeddings that implicitly get generated in the machine translation task are also very good at making analogies and, and those things that people used previously, you assume things like what to vec for. Um, so the same arguments all apply all over the place. It's not a vision specific thing, and it's not a conflict specific thing. It's a general thing. You can reuse a network trained on one task, in order to be a good feature extractor on another task.